Salutations. Welcome to Podmortem. I'm Travis Hunter, joined as always by my co-host, my sister, and my brother-in-law. Hi, I'm Renee Hunter Vasquez. Hi, I'm John Paul Vasquez. This week, we're broadcasting live from the Cairo Museum, discussing the 1932 horror classic, The Mummy. This film was directed by Carl Freund and written by John L. Balderston, based on a story by Nina Wilcox Putnam and Richard Scheer. After the opening of the tomb of the Egyptian king Tutankhamun only 10 years prior, producer Carl Limley Jr. hoped to capitalize not only on the story, but the concept of an ancient curse. This film reteams several previous Universal Horror collaborators, including Boris Karloff in yet another iconic role. With elements of romance and exploring the concepts of reincarnation and eternal life, The Mummy would achieve decent success, the status of a horror classic, and spawn several sequels, reboots, and remakes. We'd like to thank friends of the show, Michelle Moore and Lala Thomas, for recommending that we journey into the world of universal classic monsters. So, The Mummy, what were your first impressions on the film? So the lack of CGI in this movie, <laughs> I was very disappointed. <laughs> How dare All they? Right. Like not one scarab beetle. Yeah, <laughs> That's some bullshit. Um, this was the first time I watched this movie. Um, it's not bad. I, For me, honestly, I'll say so far to the three that we've covered, this was probably my least favorite. Okay. Um, but that I'm not going to discount the movie. I, it was fine. You know what I mean? I... I I, I, I wouldn't say I'd probably watch it immediately again, but you know what I mean? If it was on, I was like, eh, you know, I'll take a peek at it. Um, <laughs> but it, it wasn't it wasn't bad. It's an hour 13. Yes. Very short. Mm-hmm. Um, hour 13. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's kind of the same thing we talked about with Dracula, where there's like this weird section that you're like, I don't, why is this dragging? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How is this yeah, dragging? For the length of the film. Yeah. It doesn't make 13. a lot of sense. I, I, there, it, I did. I will be honest, and I did feel that. Mm-hmm. I, I was for such a short movie to get that feeling. It's like I don't, I don't know what it, it. I don't know what's going on, but I'm, I'm. I was just kind of there, like, what's happening, you know? Yeah, I, I agree. Um, it wasn't bad by any means. There were a couple things that I was side eyeing a little bit that I'm sure we'll get into, um, including a really forced um like you had mentioned in your intro romance yeah subplot. yeah uh there's there's one that makes perfect sense and one okay. that does not yeah, yeah. <laughs> one that actually i la- i laughed out loud a couple times because yeah. like you're fucking you're joking like there's wow. no way <laughs> quit, quit trying to label this <laughs> yeah <laughs> y'all fell in love quick in the 30s but um <laughs> um i respect its importance like i know that in uh Frankenstein, I could not say enough good about Boris Karloff. Mm. Somehow, I think that he was given more room in Frankenstein right. than he was in this. Maybe it was just a more impactful performance for me. Really? Yeah. I know that he had, spe- uh, you know, he spoke in this and he, he <laughs> was able to, I guess, have more of a presence. But right. for me, that it, his, excuse me, Frankenstein's monster yeah don't get uh performance was it just impacted me more right um but this was i mean it was good i i understand as i'm sure t you're gonna get into that it is a a a pioneer of a film it's very important in the you know scope of horror as a genre Mm -hmm. but for just the film itself i was like yeah this is fine yeah i really liked frankenstein a lot more and i loved dracula a lot more yeah well um, we know why <laughs> <laughs> there's one man but, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> who may or may not have a film in theaters right now <laughs> i love renfield okay <laughs> maybe if they had a renfield in this one and yeah. i almost thought we were gonna get one we talked but you know and we'll talk about it when we get there but this was this was not bad, but it was like John Paul said, it was my least favorite of the three that we've covered. Yeah. I am excited to to get more into it. Yes. But watching this, there are things that I'm like, did I like, did I miss something? Or it's just the way that they chose to tell the story, I think, is is a little strange. Mm-hmm. I, I can agree with that. I was thinking back to the first time that I watched it with mom when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When we watched all these universal horror pictures when i was slaving away in kindergarten go in on ki- yeah <laughs> <laughs> go on like you mean i have to take a nap <laughs> this is bullshit. That's unbelievable i'm telling my mom I'm telling yeah. that's, just, that's just what's gonna happen when i get home um 
<laughs> but it's it's very interesting to me because in my mind, in my child mind, mm-hmm. this is one of the Universal Pictures that I remembered the least. Mm-hmm. And so my memory of this film <laughs> is all mummy all the time. I mean, <laughs> that's the thing. Like, <laughs> Like it, it's like Scooby Doo level. That's yeah. the thing too, and maybe I am tainted with Scooby Doo, but maybe. that's more what I was expecting. Right. Right. So what I did not expect was a sobering meditation <laughs> <laughs> on the concept of uh, mortality. Yeah. yeah. And a timeless love. Yeah. yeah. So, but at the same time, as an adult, you realize you're like, this is actually way richer in themes yeah, it yeah. Is. than you anticipated because you think it's going to be people in some sort of castle mm-hmm. being chased around by a mummy. And yeah. I wanted more. Um, in and out of the rooms. <laughs> well, more of that. And then they're chasing him. Yeah, <laughs> more wraps. Well, we get a little. We get a uh, little. Barely. For the most part, it's under wraps. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the thing about it for me is that um, it was very interesting to not get what I expected. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I enjoyed this. I, 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 I'm not going to um, guess the level that you guys enjoyed it. I probably enjoyed it a little bit more than you guys did. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I would agree that it's my least favorite of the three that we've covered so far. Okay. Yeah. But I will say that there is a specific charm to these universal horror films. There is. Oh, yeah. The black and white, the way that they're lit, um, the performances can Mm. be a little theatrical. Yeah. (laughs) Which I do appreciate. Yes. And I just think it's a ton of fun. Um, I will admit it's a little dated in some aspects. Oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) You think? Believe it or not. (laughs) An almost 100 year old film. (laughs) This doesn't feel like 32. Get out of here. (laughs) I know 32. This isn't. This uh, ain't it. This is not it. But it's, it's such a decent watch, I think. And you still have fun with it. And um, I just feel like the importance of it can't be understated. Yeah. I feel like the importance of this film is often overshadowed by Dracula and Frankenstein. I can see that. Yeah. And so there's a couple things that come up later that we'll talk about that were literally done for the first time in this film. All right. And that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. But like you said, Boris Karloff, I think for me, there is there is something very emotive just about his eyes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so he really accomplished a lot in Frankenstein just by basically physically acting. Yeah. But then in this, when you hear his voice, mm-hmm. there is a lot. You're like, man, we were really missing out in. Oh, no. Yeah. Old Frank. <laughs> Frank's monster. I'm sorry. Old <laughs> Frank's monster. And he was what? Fred? Yeah. Right. <laughs> Whatever his name yeah. is. Um, Whatever. Yeah. It's I, pretty rude to just call him the yeah. creature. Yeah. But, yeah. I don't know, that like, is can mean. We give him a name. Yeah. Like a, Giving him a complex. Mm-hmm. Um, I will say, and I do appreciate the eyes, but I felt like they were doing the dice move a little too much towards the end. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's only compounded by the fact <laughs> that they're using the same shot yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> over and over. It's like, oh, I guess I'm not supposed to realize. Yeah. Like, okay. But I guess in 1932, you're, you're too scared to notice. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> but I think so much of this is great. I did want to talk about the production a little bit. Okay. Um, I watched this documentary very um, hilariously titled Mummy Dearest. All right. <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> And I also read an academic article from Richard Freeman. It's not as funny as Mummy Dearest, (laughs) (laughs) but it is a source. Um, (laughs) The thing was, is that uh, mummies were, at least the concept of them, were a part of public consciousness and interest because literally 10 years before this film is when they opened Tutankhamun's tomb. Mm -hmm. Right. And so throughout time, they're learning more and more about ancient Egyptians. Mm Mm-hmm. And I think it was 1932, I think a month before this film started its final writing stages, Mm -hmm. that they finally cleaned out the tomb and had explored everything. Oh, wow. So this is very fresh Uh and people are thinking and talking about it. Yeah, yeah. I guess watching this, you don't really think of it being topical. No. So like that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what got Carl Limley's attention. Yeah. Because he's like, how can we capitalize on that? <laughs> <laughs> and he also was thinking as well, um, a cheaper way to do it because this story really, I mean, is kind of public domain. Okay. It's history. Yeah. yeah. Nobody owns, they don't have to pay, you know, Bram Stoker's family. Right, right, yeah. right. To be like, can we tell a story about a mummy, please? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> 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 I don't know why he entered the negotiations. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so like angry already. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um Limley enlists the services of Nina Wilcox Putnam 
and Richard Shire, who wrote a treatment. Okay. It's like nine pages, and it's based on the story of Cagliostro, I believe his name was. Mm -hmm. Right. And he was kind of a figure in history that um, claimed to not only be immortal, Mm -hmm. but he also kind of rose the ranks of um, French aristocracy. Because he would tell stories about his life that absolutely did so not. So he was a good liar. <laughs> I, I guarantee it. Because <laughs> I look. I, <laughs> if he's, I guarantee well, it. Well, if he's still around, I don't want to piss him off. But <laughs> I, he is immortal. That, that's the thing. Yeah, yeah, be careful. That's the thing. You probably listen to Pot Mortem for sure. Um, but the thing about him is that, and I say that he made up the stories because there's no fucking way. <laughs> yeah. Nobody's immortal. I right. believe in a lot of things, but I don't believe that. And if he is immortal, then why is he just showing off at parties? Why is he <laughs> doing something Do more important? Do something right? about it. Yeah, make make a name for yourself. Um, well, he was about to have a movie about him. But. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, they kind of took that idea and were going to transplant it into Egypt. Okay. And so it was going to kind of have that idea, but there was nothing about a mummy in the story. Mm-hmm. That changes when it gets sent to John Balderston. And he had written the play that was based on Bram Stoker's Dracula that the screenplay for the film was based on. Okay. So he's been a part of Universal in some way for a little while now. Uh Uh-huh. But the interesting thing about Balderston is that he was a journalist before this, Mm -hmm. and he was there in person for the opening of Tutankhamun's Tomb. Oh, nice. And he reported on it for the New York World in 1922. So he's got this idea to kind of bring this idea of mummies into it. All right. And so... He rewrites the script. He adds a lot of the elements that we see in the film. Mm-hmm. And Limley was very intrigued by the idea of a curse. Okay. Which, interestingly, was never part of Tutankhamun's... Yeah, I, <laughs> I was going to I was gonna wait and ask yeah. because a lot of the, the accuracy of what they're talking about, these gods and stuff in here, is not right. I guarantee it. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I was like, as soon as I heard some of this stuff, I was like, okay, that's not right. Yeah. And then the movie went on and I was like, that's not right. <laughs> um, and we'll get into it later. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. Uh, that, that's interesting, man. I bet. And again... To, what did you say? It was Tutankhamun's yes. tomb? Yeah. Oh, man. And the thing is, is that they, they took some things from that story as well that I'll talk about a little bit uh-huh. um, that were interesting little nods to it that nobody really knew. And it seems like Balderson did because he was the journalist. Okay. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, but when he rewrote it, he added all those elements. And one thing that cannot be denied, and I will say, <laughs> it doesn't hurt the film for me. It's just very funny to me. Yeah. He clearly clearly modeled it after dracula the film because oh. there are so many story beats that are basically j- <laughs> just dracula yeah again and i'm not saying it hurts the film but i was like yeah and then yeah. the actors too it's like yeah, yeah. you're playing the exact same, like, yeah. oh, okay. same thing it's like all right well you know so nice we've done it twice yeah <laughs> Now, before we resurrect this film, we would like to issue a warning for spoilers. Podmortem is a very in-depth podcast, and in thoroughly discussing horror films, we have no choice but to spoil a thing or two. If you don't wish to be spoiled, please go watch the film, then come back and enjoy the show. If you've already seen the film or don't care about spoilers, let's read the scroll. So the film begins with the classic Universal Pictures logo before transitioning to a small diorama of the Great Sphinx and the Pyramids of Giza, Egypt. A pyramid turns, revealing etched into the stone the title, The Mummy. And I did get a big laugh because (laughs) Carl Limley Jr. is going to let you know that he was involved. Absolutely. (laughs) Yeah. It was literally (laughs) Carl Limley presents uh, The Mummy, produced by Carl Limley, uh, in association with Carl Limley, (laughs) with the cooperation of Carl Limley. (laughs) It's like, all right, we got it. We're so grateful for you. We need to know. (laughs) We need to know. And believe me, we know. Yeah. But amongst a lovely shot of smoke rising before a wall of hieroglyphics, we get the opening credits accompanied by Tchaikovsky's swan theme, which also opened Dracula in 1931. I love that piece so much. It's beautiful. It's amazing. And so I was like, ooh, already. And then I'm like, and I see some familiar names on here. Yes. Is there a reason they use this again? I looked this up so many times and all I could find was the idea of it being cheaper. Okay. Huh. Then commissioning music. So I was like, why are we doing Swan Lake? I, I thought know. the yeah, same thing you did in, say in that. Dracula. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think it's interesting because to me it, it lends like almost like a whimsy and and an eeriness. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because it it's sad too. Yeah. yeah. Like so yeah. That fits. It yeah. does. Yeah. Especially this one. Yeah. Yeah. 
But we cut to reveal an ancient scroll. It's partially unrolled, revealing sectioned hieroglyphics and various other drawings. On-screen text reads, This is the scroll of Thoth. Herein are set down the magic words by which Isis raised Osiris from the dead. The camera presses in as the text continues. O Amon Ra, O God of gods, death is but the doorway to new life. We live today, we shall live again in many forms, shall we return, O mighty one. The music reaches a crescendo before we fade to black. I was like, I feel like you're telling us some plot stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the beginning of Midsummer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that the text, the choice of font was really neat. Oh, yeah. yeah. And they use it pretty frequently. And I'm like, I need, what font is that? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I do want to point out, I did try to research this because there is a distinction between uh, reincarnation and resurrection. Right, right. And from my research, the idea of reincarnation wasn't exactly what was believed in ancient Egypt. Yeah, I think only the gods were allowed to be that close with Osiris and all that. Yeah. And do all that. From what I read, it was like, because um, they could be reincarnated as animals. Right. Uh, people, their hope was to be setting themselves up for eternal life. Mm -hmm. And so the afterlife, they were reincarnated into that in an, right. in an eternity. Right, right. But not through what we see in the film. Yes. So one of the major plot points yeah. <laughs> yeah. of the film is not A little exactly, flawed. Yeah. <laughs> but we'll move on. And, and that's funny you say that because I try to do research on Thoth. You're right. And all I brought up was Assassin's Creed. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, okay, cool. I'm uh -huh. not playing that game right now. But, <laughs> but I was like, I do want to, you know, try to look and see. Yeah. So it it seems that he was a moon god. Okay. And it's and it, it's funny, he was born of the seed of Horus from the forehead of Set. So he since Thoth was the son of two gods order and chaos he was the god of equilibrium okay oh. which he was worshipped or he's been worshipped from 6000 bce to 3150 okay it says to 323 bce 30 I was like, I don't know what those numbers mean, <laughs> but goddamn. But it says that he's that like one, of time, the one of the longest worshipped gods from any civilization. Okay. I was like, okay, so this, there's, these are actual gods, or you know what I mean? There's, yeah. there's the names, text, the yeah. names and stuff. See, and I think that's the thing about this film is that they use a lot of names that are accurate. Yeah. The names are accurate. The, yeah, the <laughs> names are accurate. Just don't look too close. Yeah. Yes. Now, what they do or like how you worship them is not, not it's different. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but when we fade back in, we're overlooking an excavation in modern day Egypt. I, <laughs> I don't know why I wrote modern day. I was going to ask like a <laughs> modern day. Yeah. Well, it's like a hundred years We're ago. We're using 32. air quotes. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's modern compared to ancient Egypt. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'll give, give me that. <laughs> <laughs> but the camera dips down stone pillars and pans across ancient architecture and sand. We see a sign reading field expedition season 1921 British museum. So these shots of pillars, they actually sent a team out to film in Egypt. Oh, wow. So these are actual shots of Egypt in the film. That's okay. cool. Thought that was pretty cool. At least they yeah. did that. Yeah. yeah. That's really cool. But inside of an office and at a desk, Sir Joseph Wimple, played by Arthur Byron, sits studying an artifact. Ralph Norton, played by Bramwell Fletcher, sits across from him, typing up a report. Norton asks Sir Joseph if he's trying to teach him a lesson in patience, but Sir Joseph just takes off his glasses chuckling, telling him that method is everything in archaeology, and they always deal with their findings of the day in order. Norton shares that the very interesting find that they made today of that peculiar gentleman over there is the only find that they've made in the last two months that will bring any medals from the British Museum. <laughs> I gotta admit... When he said that, I was like, they've already found him. Yeah. <laughs> we don't see I, that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. We're already set up. Yes. Oh, all right. All right. It's like we joined the mummy in progress. Yeah. <laughs> like this is 73 minutes. We yeah. need to hit the ground running. Get with it. <laughs> but Sir Joseph is a bit annoyed, saying that they didn't come here to earn medals and that much more is learned from studying bits of pottery, as he's currently doing, than the sensational finds that Norton is wrapped up in. No pun intended. Nah. <laughs> but he says their job is to increase the sum of human knowledge of the past, not to satisfy their own curiosity. Why can't it be both, though? 
That's literally why you would get I'm, into this. Yeah. You know, I'm team what's in the box. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, you just want the tea. I yeah. do, of course. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to lie about like, that. I've never hidden that. <laughs> <laughs> not once. But in a wide shot, we see another man tending to the find that Norton is so intrigued by. An open sarcophagus, a distant figure inside, arms clasped at its shoulders. Norton agrees with Sir Joseph's point, but doesn't understand how he isn't chomping at the bit to check out his recent finding. Sir Joseph reminds him that this is Norton's first trip while he's been out here for a decade now. He gets a little pissy, flat out saying that he's way more interested in that mummy and sarcophagus than Norton is. <laughs> he's like, so you need to chill. <laughs> if I can keep it in check. Yeah. <laughs> I do get what he's saying partially, but there's no way that I'm not... We'll, Every single day, I get that that's our plan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We wake up, we have our plan that we're going to (laughs) do things in order. But But um, there are extenuating circumstances. Yes, how can I look at a piece of pottery when there's a fucking human body behind me? (laughs) Literally. (laughs) Currently. (laughs) But the man who had his back to us a moment ago turns around, revealing himself to be Dr. Muller, played by our old pal, Edward Van Sloan. If you recall... He was Van Helsing in Dracula, and he was Dr. Waldman in Frankenstein. Yeah. He is three for three on our trip. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I appreciate his performance here. I will say that there are a lot of times that he has kind of a snarky grin to a lot of his lines Mm -hmm. that I don't know fit exactly. (laughs) (laughs) He seems a little too happy when things go south. Yeah. Yeah, That was a choice, you know? It was a choice, and it makes me suspect (laughs) something's happening behind the scenes, but um, always love to see Edward Van Sloan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But Muller tells his colleagues that the viscera hasn't been removed from the mummy, and the usual scar made by the embalmer's knife isn't there either. So I was surprised to hear that the viscera hadn't been removed, Mm -hmm. because I learned a lot about how mummies are prepared by Steve Buscemi and Tales from the Dark Side, (laughs) and that's not how you do it. Uh, No, it is not. (laughs) You know, it's like really surprising. I read this academic article, and they were talking about the only instances of mummies being used in fiction before this yeah yeah and the only one that i knew because there was only like two of them Mm -hmm. but one of them was lot 249 oh wow okay so this idea of using mummies in this way is very new right yeah and it's just interesting to see because we all have in our minds we can call upon the lore and yeah which is funny because what we think of with mummies was really introduced in the inferior sequels to this film yeah (laughs) because it's not really here no no it's not no but this surprised me because after muller explains his findings about the lack of the removal Mm -hmm. of the organs sir joseph goes i figured as much why yeah Yeah. (laughs) where did you get that from? you haven't looked at the body at all you've been looking at pottery all day yeah (laughs) But Norton heads over to Muller to get a closer look, explaining that he took a ton of pictures when they opened the sarcophagus and that he's never seen a mummy quite like this one. Muller concurs, investigating further with a magnifying glass. Back up a little bit, man. (laughs) He's all up in it. We get a tight shot of the mummy, Imhotep, played by Boris Karloff. Woo! Love him. He's credited um, in the marketing as Karloff the Uncanny. (laughs) I watched right. a, like, I watched yeah. a yeah. video yeah. that they were really, really pushing yes. for him to be the next big thing. Yeah. And uh, that that was the billing because they're like, look, we need nothing else. It's it's Karloff. Yeah. You know? Well, if you recall in Frankenstein, they, it said like the monster and it was like, oh, huh? yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a question mark. And he's like, I'm going to need prominence. Uh, <laughs> <Literally, yeah. laughs> prominent building. Respect on my name. <laughs> I and I get that. <laughs> why? Why didn't they make him like the uh, the lead or something? Then why do you keep making him a monster? Make him the badass or make him something? I think in why? here he gets. Well, what you mean is like a protagonist? Yeah. Oh, why that's not no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> why do you keep covering his face? <laughs> We're not gonna be it's doing like, that. No. <laughs> You're our face, but you can't see my face. No, no, no. <laughs> just the eyes. Yeah, yeah. just that one shot. <laughs> With that's him, all that's need. all you need. Yeah. yeah. Um, I did want to talk about the makeup. Of course, it was done by Jack Pierce, okay. who was Universal's go-to person at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think we even talked about him on previous episodes right. for the Frankenstein makeup. But Universal actually put out press releases saying that Pierce had painstakingly studied embalming methods to perfect his makeup. Probably not true. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh my God. <laughs> but, but what is true is uh, Karloff's daughter in the documentary I watched 
said that the makeup took longer to put on and take off than Karloff's makeup for Frankenstein. Damn. And that includes this makeup that we see here and the makeup that we'll see later. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And in the same documentary, Rick Baker estimated that it would have taken Jack Pierce eight hours to apply this makeup. Jesus Christ. It's unbelievable. Yeah. And the removal was fucking painful. Oh, I bet. Because they're using these adhesives to kind of stretch the skin so you can create these wrinkles. Oh, no, no. And then you have to take it off. Yeah, Yeah, let's not do that. I read that it, it was, they had put so much on that it was hard for him to even, he couldn't even express his he had no expression yeah because he's his like his face is like taped down <laughs> oh, it's 32 i'm sure they were experimenting with some oh, shit. yeah, yeah. and he was probably that's probably why his eyes are so emotive he's like this is all i got yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's so all i can do i have to make it work <laughs> i did read too or i saw in that that video that i had watched that he passed out they said that it was suffocation because he had Jeez, no, he couldn't, nuts. he couldn't breathe. Like he, his well, skin yeah, was, yeah. You cover all your pores. You can't sweat. You can't cool down. No. That they had to cut some of it off. Uh-huh. And then he was like, whoa, he came back or whatever. <laughs> I was like, that's wild. <laughs> well, fuck. That's, that's how he came like, back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was, <Look> guys. <laughs> whoa, that was a trip. <laughs> that was wild. <laughs> um... I also saw in that documentary that they did wrap him completely for this scene. Okay. And they did it so efficiently and it took so long, but there were issues because they didn't give him an option for bathroom breaks. Oh, oh my God. Come on. Yeah. And so I was like, is that why there's only one scene of that? Yeah. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> like, this is all we need. That's all we can do. You got all you need, Carl, because I'm yeah. fucking done. <laughs> But Norton surmises that Emotep died very unpleasantly, and Muller agrees, noting his contorted muscles and surmising that he must have struggled against the bandages and was buried alive. I don't think that's what happened. Not. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> but I was like, damn, for all, the movie, right? We'll, 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 he's yeah. just looking at him too. Like yeah. I don't. He's he's telling a lot. Just yeah. Like by being like, yeah, that he was buried alive for sure. And I and I I know this is uh, wait twenty one. <laughs> Uh, so, right yeah. for okay yeah um, you just got this dude leaned up against the wall yeah yeah you're not worried about him falling out dude, or anything he's like no <laughs> he's balanced yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah right. say weekend at burning <laughs> what the fuck i love i because i was like well maybe they should have the uh sarcophagus down yeah, yeah. like you maybe would he's like i've been doing this yeah. for 10 years yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll prop him up <laughs> <laughs> you've been here how long is your first trip yeah. <laughs> you mind your own business <laughs> But Muller reads from hieroglyphic inscriptions on the inside of the sarcophagus. Emotep, high priest of the temple of the son of Karnak. One thing I did see in my bit of research about uh, Emotep is he had a lot of talents. Right. But he was most known for being an architect. Mm -hmm. And he designed some of the first pyramids. Right. Oh, wow. He actually was very few of the non-royals to become a god after death. And then in 2001, I think he was only part of a like a dozen of that had been made gods after death. I did not like, know that. He was very well respected. He was like everybody like like read his stuff. Like they even said that he could have been the father of medicine. Really? Yeah. Wow. That he was like responsible for helping and doing tons of shit. And like around at the time. So hearing it, this I was like, that's Let's not make him true. A scary yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was like, you stri- stripped everything yes. from him, disgraced him in the movie. Uh, yes. <laughs> and then, and, yes. <laughs> dude, it's, uh, there, there comes a point, like, I'm with Emotep for a lot of this, and I'm like, oh, you've lost me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now you've gone too yeah. far. <laughs> so there's a lot of disrespect yeah. on this man's name. <laughs> but, but it's a movie. That's yes. Wild. Yes, it's just a movie. But Norton gives his sympathies to Emotep, wondering what he could have done to be treated so viciously. But Sir Joseph supposes that Emotep was executed for treason. Muller disagrees, saying it was most likely sacrilege. He points the men's attention to the weathered spells on the interior of the sarcophagus that are meant to protect the soul in its journey to the underworld, and he shows that they've been chipped away. Damn. Yeah. Yeah. None of that. Nope. That's that's Mm-mm. rough. Yeah. That's very hurtful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and if he's buried alive, he has to look at that. Well, yeah. it's probably dark. Oh, so- so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, probably for, it's probably for the best. I think his glow sticks ran <laughs> out. Yeah. He's like, no, I can't see no more. He's like, my flashlight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
But Norton guesses that Emotep attempted to get into some escapades with the Vestal Virgins of the Temple, and Muller doesn't disagree and says that the priestesses of the Temple of Karnak were the daughters of the reigning pharaohs and were the sacred virgins of the goddess Isis. But Norton just says that the answers are probably in the box that they found him in. He's like, now back to this box. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they walk over to it, removing a lid of rotten wood and pulling out a heavy artifact covered in cloth. <laughs> I will say them acting like it's heavy. I was like, all right. <laughs> I was like, this is theater. Yeah, but, <laughs> this is but they did good though. They Honestly, did. I was like, okay, okay. And this this is the stuff to me that has all the charm in the world. Yes. Yeah. Watching yeah. them pretend that this is 800 pounds. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But they remove the cloth and dust fills the area as the men reveal a dusty casket underneath. First, assuming it to be made of copper, the men test the material and learn that it's made of gold. The chest is locked and secured with the unbroken seal of the pharaoh Amenophis. Norton determines it to be a temple treasure, and Sir Joseph wastes no time cracking it open. Removing the heavy lid, the men find an ornate box complete with small golden statues at each corner. Placing it on the table... Sir Joseph reads slowly, translating the symbols. Death, eternal torture for anyone who opens this casket in the name of Amon Ra, the king of the gods. So, not not good. No. no. <laughs> Let's put it back. Yeah. Let's, yeah. <laughs> Let's put it back. Or let me go and then hands. you guys. You guys I'm have sorry. Fun. Yeah, carry yeah. on. So the thing about this is that there there was always this concept of this of of curses from ancient Egypt. Right. And from what I read, like it was all based off of deaths that happened to people associated with the um opening of Tutankhamun's tomb. Right. Mm-hmm. But the reality is there were never any messages like this on the tomb. This is kind of our revisionist history with myths. Yeah. To where we are like, oh, it was always cursed. And that's just not true. That's yeah. interesting yeah. because it's almost synonymous. Yeah. Like it's so widely like that is very interesting. So I was like kind of and now I, I don't know about every tomb, but I right. know that we're that one. Yeah. And this is what we're basing it off of most. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it was just kind of interesting to me because, again, that forms. Well, honestly, it. I was going to say it forms the basis for the entire film. But the curse idea kind of just goes out the window after a while. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, on the cool, yeah. It, yeah. it becomes something else entirely. Yeah. it's It becomes way more personal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> but Sir Joseph is shocked, calling it a terrible curse. But Norton's like, no time like the present, and just goes right to open the box, but is stopped by a fearful Muller. Muller warns them of the supernatural implications, and Sir Joseph recognizes his expertise in the occult sciences, but he says that he's not going to allow his beliefs to interfere with their work. Muller's like, then why am I here? Yeah. Like, what do you want me for? Yeah. Sir Joseph just explains that he sees him as a friend and an expert. Considering how unique this find was, he wanted Muller's input, but he's not going to let him get in the way. He's like, I, you can <laughs> you can give your opinion as long as it doesn't spoil our fun. Yeah, I was going to say, you okay, hold on. Yes. <laughs> what did you just say? Yeah. Now, what are you saying? <laughs> what? what the fuck? You call me I want here. your opinion as long as it's the same as mine. Yeah, to yes. give you my input. Now you want me to fuck off. Yes. Yeah. I, uh, He's like, I meant your academic input. Yeah. yeah no, that, that's what it is. <laughs> same, same shit. Yeah. Do, you, do you think this is cool? Yeah. <laughs> that's it. No. All right. Leave. Yeah. Like, you know out. where the door is. <laughs> but Norton just says that a thousand years in the dirt will take the piss out of any old curse. And Muller gives, I love this insult so much because right after Norton says this, Muller goes, bah. I can't speak before a boy. I was like, I I, I have that in my notes that that would cut deep. (laughs) Because the way he says it, he's like, I can't even fucking, like, there's no point. Yeah. Yeah. But Muller invites Sir Joseph to come outside under the stars of Egypt and not to touch that casket that they've found. Muller goes to put on his jacket and hat and grab his cane. But Sir Joseph just quietly says to Norton, (laughs) he goes, he goes, catalog it. We'll open it later. <laughs> yeah. This, <laughs> wait till he leaves. Yeah. yeah. He's, He's like, said, no, we're still doing it. Yeah. Is Poochie all right with everyone? Yeah. <laughs> Just completely ignore. I was like, oh my God. Whatever happens to y'all, you've yeah. you've asked for oh, it no, at this yeah. point. He warned you. Yeah. yeah. He fucking told you. But here we are. <laughs> we'll open it later. <laughs> <laughs> but as Muller steps out, Sir Joseph follows him talking shit the entire way, saying that he's not about to keep them from exploring their most meaningful find of this entire expedition. But as they leave, 
Norton sits down at his desk, looking over a piece of stone. I swear to God, the second they stepped out, I thought he was just going to crack it open. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> over well, the lips the, and I mean, through the gums or whatever. <laughs> Look how cursy I go or whatever. Also, if I'm, <laughs> if I'm Ematap. Yeah, I'm. My feelings are hurt that you're calling that box the best thing that you found today. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, I, I'm right here. I'm yeah. right here, yeah. propped up against the wall, like leaning nothing. against the wall. Way yeah, for, yeah, that's true. You don't even care if I fall. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but we're all obsessed about the box. Yeah. whatever. <laughs> but outside, with the pyramids in full view behind them, Sir Joseph explains to Muller that if he's right about the legend, then the casket they've found could contain the scroll of Thoth. And he can't wait to find out. <laughs> it's like, so you're just taking all of my warnings yeah, yeah. and just chucking them in the garbage. Yeah, fuck them. Yeah. <laughs> but Muller explains that the gods of Egypt still live here in their ruined temples. And while their ancient spells are weaker, some are still potent. And he does believe that the scroll of Thoth is in Sir Joseph's possession, which contains the great spell that Isis used to raise Osiris from the dead. So I will say just very quickly, because I feel like it's important. Mm -hmm. It is difficult to view some of this through a contemporary lens. Yeah. Because you're like, you know, it's cool that Muller is seemingly respecting these ancient civilizations. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, he's basically like, this culture is scary. <laughs> <laughs> Which is like really offensive. It's yeah. like one step forward, two steps back. Yeah. <laughs> so it gets a little tough at times. But you got to I think that's the thing is viewing a lot of these films through the lens of this was made almost a hundred years ago. Yeah. yeah. And so and there's some stuff that comes up later that you're like, yeah, yikes. But you're like, this was made almost a hundred years yeah. ago. Yeah. And so it, it gets difficult, but uh, stay with us. Mm. Yeah. Stay tuned. But inside Norton can't contain his curiosity any longer. The camera sweeps around him as he raises a lamp to the casket and looks at it with anticipation. It has been 30 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> Don't you do it, fucker. I can see you. <laughs> yeah. It's like I'm yeah. watching yeah. you through the... <laughs> he cannot help himself. But just as he's about to open it, he sets the lamp down, thinks better of it, and picks up the old stone again. But literally two seconds later, <laughs> he picks it up again, stands up, surveying the casket. His hands on either side, he opens it up, the lid coming off with a small echo. He looks inside, wiping his hands on his shirt and reaching in to retrieve the scroll of Thoth. Put it back. <laughs> it's, it's not too late. Yeah. You just no, touched it. Yeah, it's that, too no. late. Oh, but <laughs> well, he, hasn't, he hasn't read it. Yeah. I guess. You're on the line. Yeah, no, he is. If Evil Dead has taught us anything, you got to say the words. If you <laughs> yeah, don't say fair it. Fair enough. Yes. Finding the book. Yeah. That never hurt anyone. Fair enough. Except all those people that like cut yeah. their, <laughs> they often cut their finger on a page. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's always part of it. Um, but it's not as bad as what came later. No. Yeah, I did want to call out this sequence because I feel like the entire pacing of it is really good. Mm -hmm. Um, and the way that it's shot, it really sells the suspense of the moment. Yeah, it does. The cinematographer for this film was Charles Stumar, and I think it is really interesting work here, especially for the time. Mm -hmm. But then you also remember that Carl Freund who directed the film, right. was a cinematographer in his own right. Yeah. yeah. Because he shot Necropolis and Dracula. Mm -hmm. And so you have these two minds are coming up with all these interesting things. We talked to, I think it was on Dracula, about all the stuff that Carl Freund did for cinematography. Yeah. Right. He basically invented the three camera sitcom. Oh, nice. With I Love Lucy. Yeah, yeah. And then he invented the unchained camera method, which allowed camera movement yeah. off yeah, of that's a tripod. And we get that a lot here. That's yeah. amazing. So I just think this film is shot well and it doesn't get a lot of credit. Yeah. It's funny because off mic, I was like, T, did you know that he did I Love Lucy? And he was like, yeah, I said that in Dracula. Yeah. I was like, oh. <laughs> 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 There's just too much information in here. I yeah. get something's got to get. <laughs> and it was Carl Freund. It was, <laughs> <laughs> it was his work on I Love Lucy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but Norton unties a small ribbon and places it at his workstation unrolling the thick paper of hieroglyphics and staring at it in awe. Outside, Muller pleads with his friend, put back the casket and bury it where you found it. He asks him, considering that he's read the curse, would he dare to defy it? Sir Joseph says in the interest of science, even if he believed in the curse, he has to continue his work for the British Museum. He asks Muller to come back with him to examine the great find together, but Muller isn't about that life, 
saying that he can't condone an act of such sacrilege with his presence, and he descends the steps. He said, my name's Paul, and the shit's <laughs> yeah. between all. He laughed. He did. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> he like, got into a waiting car. And just... <laughs> <laughs> Fuck this. Yeah. Good luck, guys. <laughs> <laughs> but back inside, Norton looks at the scroll, writing down a translation on his notepad. The camera pans to the body of Emotep, then back to Norton, who has finished his work. He raises the page in front of his face and reads the words quietly. In a tight shot, small breaths slowly fill Imhotep's lungs and his eyes, closed in the sleep of death for thousands of years, slowly open. Now you've got a lawsuit on your hands. (laughs) (laughs) His wrapped arms break free of their dusty crossing and fall to his side just as Norton continues his whispering. I know that you just found something very mm-hmm. interesting mm-hmm. and that you were very curious and now you're inspecting it i get it you don't hear that dusty ass movement behind you is that bones creaking yeah i <laughs> creak when i move and, <laughs> and I'm, I'm 33 <laughs> you're not 3300 exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but the camera dips down from norton to the scroll where we see emotep's ancient but living hand reach for it i have to be honest <laughs> This is still really creepy. <laughs> I was like, Fuck! yeah. And I think there's, it's just the attention to detail, how old his hand looks. Yeah. Mm-hmm. His ring on his finger is so dusty. Mm-hmm. And then you see a little bit of dirt on one of his fingers. Yeah. And it's like, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> but Emotep seizes it just as Norton notices that he's there. Norton screams wildly, rising up from his seat and cowering away slowly. But this is what you wanted, right? Yeah, you fucked us. Yeah. You started reading this. I mean... You read the Necronomicon. Yeah. <laughs> what? Don't be surprised now. Yeah, exactly. dude. You were warned. What the fuck? <laughs> but with his back against the wall, Norton just begins to laugh madly as the camera pans over past footprints on the floor as we watch long strips of cloth dragged behind Emotep as he exits the hut. I did appreciate how we just saw him shuffling out. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, I'm done. That's all I needed. So was he laughing because of that? or He, he lost it. He, he's gone mad. Yeah. Oh, I th- he's like, you got no pants on. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, ha, ha. Yeah. Um, You see that jerk? Yeah. <laughs> I got to say, when Norton is laughing, his mind clearly broken. Mm-hmm. I'm like, this is the mummy's Brinfield. Yes. Yes. I'm in. I'm so invested and mm-hmm. i'm so excited for how much norton we're gonna get yeah. yeah and i can't wait to tell you all about it <laughs> <laughs> but the camera finds emotep's empty sarcophagus and the empty casket as norton just continues laughing sir joseph hears norton's laughter and rushes to him grabbing him by the shoulders and asking him what's the matter through his laughs norton chokes out he went for a little walk you should have seen his face I was like, I don't know that that's... (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But Sir Joseph sits him down in a chair where he continues his frenzied laughter. Sir Joseph walks over to the desk where the scroll of Thoth once sat, finding only a dusty handprint and a page of hieroglyphics that Norton previously translated, and we fade to black. So... I forgot that Norton translated that mm-hmm. because the uh, the mummy coming to life was so cool and I was so c- focused on that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I thought Emotep left a goodbye letter. <laughs> <laughs> like an autograph? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> don't look for me. Yeah. Don't like, you know, but I was like, oh, yeah, that's right. We, yeah. That was he the was whole thing. He was working on that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but when we fade back in, we find a Union Jack flag flying overhead before the camera pans over to a sign that now reads... Field Expedition, season 1932, British Museum. Oh, time jump. Indeed. So yeah. now now we're in 32. Yes. All right. yeah. Now we're in modern times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but men gather outside of a building, waving to Frank Wimple, Sir Joseph's son, played by David Manners. And if you recall, David Manners was John Harker in Dracula. Hey. And it's hilarious how similar the these parallels. Yeah. <laughs> It only gets more apparent as it goes on. But Frank peers off into the distance before heading inside of a building. Inside, he finds Professor Pearson, played by Leonard Muti. Frank tells Pearson that he sees a visitor coming up the trail from the Nile, which should break the monotony. Pearson asks who it could be, but Frank couldn't tell from the glare, and so Pearson just replies, dejected, that they should probably head back to London. 
He remarks what fools they look. The money wasted, hole after hole blasted in the desert, and for what? A few beads and a few broken pots? He sums it up. A man needs more than hard work in archaeology. He needs flair and luck, like Frank's father had. I thought that pots were like the most important thing you could find. Yeah. That's what Sir Joseph said. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't study at the school of Sir Joseph, I guess. <laughs> but Frank counters that when his father excavated sites, there wasn't much competition. But Pearson says that at least his father found things. Pearson looks off theatrically, admitting that once, 10 years ago, Frank's father found too much. <gasps> Ooh. Yeah. I... I do appreciate you using the word theatrically because I have in my notes that this scene feels like a play. Yes. Yeah. The way that they're talking, the the blocking, mm -hmm. it feels like a theatrical performance. I really love these moments in these movies a lot. Yeah. Because yeah. you can straight up. And I know that the first two, I think, were based on plays that were based on novels. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you feel that. But yeah. this one wasn't. Yeah. And so it's it's just interesting. Yeah. But Frank is shocked to realize that it was 10 years ago that his father found all of that and says that it's such an odd story about Norton going mad. But he says that his guess is Norton went mad from the boredom. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> can you cite your sources? Yeah. <laughs> Pearson says that Norton was laughing when his father found him and he died laughing in a straitjacket. He died laughing yeah. in a straitjacket? Yes. Can we talk? I was <laughs> yeah. fucking heartbroken yeah i wanted so much more norton in this not yeah. one spider not, not one bug was eaten no nope. nope. uh, it, it, just a shame just nope. wasted potential not one and he died off screen yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not one laughing shot from the brig of a ship no yeah. not no. one um and i did love that he kind of <laughs> frank had a moment like i did on our evil dead episode <laughs> because he was like <laughs> <laughs> he was like, he probably died of boredom. Oh, no, he died. Yeah. <laughs> she oh, stalled herself. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, that's not funny anymore. <laughs> oh, geez, yeah. dude. Tonal shift. Yeah. But um, yeah, how disappointing. I yeah. was very upset. But as Frank lights a cigarette with Pearson's lighter, Pearson continues that even stranger, when Sir Joseph, the greatest excavator to ever come from England, who loved Egypt, vowed to never come back, that meant something. Frank just hands Pearson back his lighter, and after they hear a knock at the door, we see a tall man standing there through the slats. The door seemingly <laughs> <laughs> seemingly opens on its own. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but Pearson invites the man in anyway, and in a tight shot, we meet Ardith Bay, played by Boris Karloff. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so... I mean, yes. we, we know what's happening here. I mean, what a regular aged human that guy is. Yeah. Right? His face, clearly. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> Regulation skin, <laughs> you know. Yes. Uh, doesn't look aged or weathered. <laughs> or yeah. Like, Not at all. Maybe like he was buried alive. Or <laughs> <laughs> newly resurrected. <laughs> Not even a little bit. No, this is Ardith Bay. <laughs> yes. All right. Ardith's eyes shift as he steps inside and it's not like evil or anything no not yeah. at all but in a very deep voice he asks pearson if his colleagues have returned to london which they have and he tells the two men that their expedition has not been a success after pearson shows off his laughable haul for the season ardith presents the men with what he deems to be the most sensational find since the tomb of tutankhamun pearson is receptive and thankful but asks why he's helping them Ardith explains that Egyptians aren't permitted to dig up their ancient dead, and with a clear bit of disdain, says that that practice is reserved for foreign museums. Damn. Yeah. yeah. Ouch. <laughs> so you're acting a bit weird, mister. Yeah. <laughs> Why don't you wait in this coffin? <laughs> whoa, 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 we'll get right Make we'll yourself get right comfortable. Back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my, my thing about that is I was like, oh, are they trying to yeah. do some commentary? Right. But um, it's also, <laughs> well, no, I can't say that yet. I was going to say okay. it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wanted to say that it's very personal for him <laughs> but in all fairness it is personal because even if he is just a man who lives in this country they are plundering they are yeah their ancient civilizations yeah mm -hmm. to put on display yeah yeah so it's i mean it's pretty uh there's commentary yeah. Here. yeah but he tells them that what he's giving them is part of the funerary equipment for the princess anxanaman the daughter of amenophis Pearson inspects the artifact and he's like, yeah, it says her name. 
It's like, why would Ardith lie? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you have Let to me check? double check. <laughs> <laughs> I did want to point out that Anxanamen was the name of the wife of Tutankhamun. Oh, okay. Mm. So yeah. they're reusing. Right, right. Yeah. Which I, again, I, I feel is interesting in a way. Yeah. yeah. But Ardith says that he found that artifact not a hundred yards from here. And Frank asks if he thinks that her tomb is here. Ardith simply says that he'll show them where to dig. Pearson and Frank are intrigued, and Ardith introduces himself to them before they head out together. I feel as though a hundred yards is not very far. Yeah. And they've been here an entire season. Yeah. What have you been doing? Literally. Yeah. No offense to these ex- <laughs> <laughs> excavators. They're no Sir Joseph Wimple. I'll just yeah, say that. No. Right. Um, one thing I did want to point out that they talked about on commentary was that this is the first Universal film to showcase all of Karloff's talents. Okay. Like we brought up in the intro, this is the first time that he's been able to speak. Yeah. yeah. And, and he's got a great voice. Yes. Yeah. And so you have a star in Karloff who is so powerful just in look alone. Mm-hmm. And then on top of that, you have the powerful voice. Yeah. And so it's no wonder that he kind of became their go-to yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. for these films. Um, and I just think that he's brilliant in this. He, he's oh, he's no, just yeah. brilliant. Period. Yeah. But panning over a wide shot of the area, Ardith stands on a ridge with Frank and Pearson, pointing out exactly where to dig. Pearson just smokes a pipe, saying that the circumstantial evidence is not very strong, but says that if they put a team from Kerna on the job, they can tell Ardith within two days if anything is here. Ardith, who overheard that and is incredibly impatient, tells him, one day, Professor... Okay. <laughs> yeah, so like, are you telling me to hurry? I, or, yeah. I don't, like, what, yeah. what is going on? I part well. <laughs> I think he knows how deep everything is. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, it's not. You don't have to yeah. trust yeah. me. It'll only be a day. In about twenty-four hours, yeah. <laughs> you'll see. But the camera dips down to the future excavation site, and in a crossfade, the scene is now filled with men chipping away and removing the rock and sand while all singing together. After a while, a worker screams out to Frank and Pearson, who are, <laughs> who are reclining under yes. an umbrella. Yes. Yeah. And will soon receive credit for all of this. Yeah. yeah. Uh, first of all, they were tearing it up with the singing. They were. Uh, yeah. Secondly, I was like, isn't this your expedition? And they're literally sitting on their asses. Yeah. You should be in there helping. Yes. Yes. And see, At and this, the very least. Yeah. This is where I think some of the commentary has to be coming from. Yeah. Yeah. Because there is a, a bit of dialogue later, specifically from Frank, and I'm like, fuck you, Frank. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm wondering if that's what they're intending here. Okay. And this scene made me like <laughs> very annoyed. I was like, for real? Because <laughs> the way it pans over, yeah. I was like, you're fucking joking. He's reclining. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just relax. Yes. Keep working on a tan. It, it's, it's infuriating. <laughs> but the men rush away from all their comfort. And see that at the end of the site, the men have uncovered what appears to be steps on a staircase. Frank and Pearson admit that Ardith Bay was right, and the workers continue excavating. Time passes, and after a while, the workers uncover a tomb. Frank and Pearson find an inscription of hieroglyphics outside of the door, revealing it to be the tomb of Anxanaman. Pearson says that they should contact Sir Joseph, as he should be here for such an important finding. But the men also find a seal on the tomb one of the seven jackals, revealing that the tomb hasn't been opened since it was sealed 3,700 years ago. Mm-mm. Not jackals. Yeah. Mm-mm. Well, we know what the jackals do. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> we do. <laughs> they have babies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so on and so forth. <laughs> yes. Uh. So I tried to look this up as well, and I had no luck finding anything on this. Just period? Yeah. I don't know if maybe I was looking, uh, if I was Googling the wrong way or if I was what, but I I just could not find anything on this. I wonder if it has any significance or if it's just something created for the film. Right. Yeah. Because they do a lot of things that have meaning or at least seem to. Mm-hmm. And then you realize that it was just straight up created for the yeah. film. Yeah. So I'm like, I don't know. It It would have been interesting considering how fresh everything was to know how much knowledge they had at the time. Yeah. Yeah. To pull from. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, I don't know. But we fade to black, and when we fade back in, we see the Egyptian Mail newspaper shown articles that detail Frank and Pearson's finding of the tomb of an ancient princess, the sub-headline announcing that Sir Joseph Wimple has returned to Egypt to supervise the finding by the British Museum expedition. Frank and Pearson's finding. Yes. Yeah. They're just sipping like... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Drinking lemonade. Yeah. <laughs> a lemonade and a beer, but they get credit for it. Okay. Mm, all right, sure. 
it's 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 disappointing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But the newspaper article actually has a decent lead. I read it. It was pretty fantastic. And it describes the findings and also tells the reader that the findings were aided by the Egyptian scholar, Ardeth Bey. Huh. Yeah, all right. Interesting. But sometime later at the Cairo Museum, there's a full gallery devoted to the mummy and the complete funerary equipment of the princess Anxanamen discovered by the British Field Force. The camera glides over the artifacts, some out on display, some encased in glass, but it continues through the room until it finds Ardith Bay alone, overlooking the mummified body of Oxenamen. But after a quick shot of a rotating photo of the Egyptian skyline, we transition neatly to an upscale party. There at the party, overlooking the pyramids from a window, is Helen Grosvenor, played by Zita Johan. So Zita Johan was far more prominent in theater mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. she was a well-known broadway actress all right and she was married at the time to john hausman all right and he insisted and pleaded with her to move to los angeles to pursue roles in film mm-hmm. she notoriously hated hollywood Is there yeah. a reason why she just hated the vibe the culture the yeah. everything and so whenever she was working in film, she only did about eight films her entire career. Yeah. And got out. She was just yeah. done. She knew it was toxic. Yes. She's like, nah, yeah. this, this ain't for me. <laughs> uh, the cool thing about her, though, is in later interviews later in her life, uh-huh. um, it was well established how interested she was in the occult. Okay. And how much she believed in the concept of reincarnation. Which, interestingly, is, yeah. mm-hmm, plays very much yeah. into this character. She had very interesting acting methods and they were very well realized in every acting role she took, Mm -hmm. but it did lead to some difficulties with Carl Freund, the director. Yeah. All I read was that they hated each other. They did not get along well. Um, He kind of (laughs) framed it as she thought that she was better than everybody else because she was a stage actress and not, she didn't do films. Uh, but she said that he was very rude to her. Um, in her point of view, from what I read, this was his debut, his directorial debut. Mm-hmm. And so she thought that he thought that this was going to fail and he wanted somebody to blame it on. And he decided to blame it on her. What? So she said that he was very rude to her. There's something that we talked about off mic yes. that we can't talk about until later. But she even said that she tried to, and this is an interview that I had read, that she tried, she invited him and his wife to her house for dinner mm-hmm. to try to kind of, you know, let's all be cool. We got to work together. Yeah. And he had told her that in one of the scenes, she was going to have to be completely nude from the waist up. And that she was like, okay, like try getting it past the sensors and I'll do it. Yeah. That she felt like he was trying to use her as a roadblock. That he expected her to say no. And then he can go back and be like, I'm trying to do all these things with this film and she won't let me. But she right. was like, yeah, get it do past it. the sensors and I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was it. It seemed like there. It was a lot. It was very rough. Yeah, yeah. What a lot of film historians said was that um, he was wanting to take out his fear of that failure on everyone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but he knew that he couldn't take it out on Boris Karloff because of Karloff's star power. Right. Ah. Uh, but Zita Johan, and that's, that's why fucked up. it's the most fucked and up thing ever. And she's a woman, so I yeah, mean, it's bullshit. It, it's and fucked she, up. And she, I mean, she does so great in this film despite yeah. his bullshit. Yeah. And she seems outside as a very cool person. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, I I wish it was just more of a misunderstanding to where he was, you know what I mean? He was being rude and he didn't mean to come off like that and she thought he was, you know what I mean? Like yeah. they could have just missed each other, but if it he doesn't was- doesn't sound like Yeah, <laughs> but if he was being a dick just to be a dick, that's not, yeah. you know, don't do that, man. No. Yeah. And on your directorial debut, yeah, yeah. I know. this is what you're doing? <laughs> what <Yeah>. a reputation. <laughs> Jesus. But people slow dance and music plays in the background as Muller joins Helen admiring the view. I said it was a window is more of a balcony. Yeah. Yeah. But Helen calls it the real Egypt before asking Muller if they're really in this dreadful modern Cairo. So you see that she has kind of a desire for antiquated things right uh-huh. and so they're establishing that with basically her first line in the film which is very interesting yeah mm-hmm. but muller comments that her thoughts are far from the dance floor and the nice english boys here helen stands up quickly reassuring him that she's having a wonderful time and that she's grateful to be staying with him here 
Man, she was just all emo a minute ago, and then now she's like, yeah. She's like, it's cool, it's cool, it's yeah, cool. Well, you don't get it. It's fine. <laughs> well, <laughs> he made it like, whoa, that's weird. You know, I'm giving you all this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. You have feelings? What yeah. The fuck? That's weird. <laughs> she's like, no, I'm having a wonderful time. <laughs> but she says that it beats being with her father in the beastly hot Sudan. Muller says that, in fact, he's the one who's grateful and calls Helen his most interesting patient. Helen smiles as the song ends and the slow dancing party goers clap together. So from this little interaction, mm-hmm. I thought that they were dating. I have in my notes, what is this arrangement? Yes. Because it, it's, yeah, it was, it's uh, very strange. Yes. I don't know what's happening. But we see shortly that this is entirely not true. Yeah. So it was just weird that they wrote these lines this way. It, it, it is strange. It it's was a little confusing. confusing. Yeah. And it's very strange because they set up exactly what her history is, why she's here. Yeah. And then two seconds later, we see gentleman number one, played by C. Montague Shaw, smoking a cigar as gentleman number two, played by Leland Hodgson, asks him if he knows who Muller and Helen are. So we're about to get a second explanation. Yeah. Yeah. They stand out of focus in the background as number one explains that Helen's father is the governor of Sudan and she's currently staying with Muller and his wife who always spend their winters here. He makes note that Helen is half Egyptian and her family tree is a mile long. I was like, this dude just knows all the tea. Yeah. I, yeah. I, like, I don't know why we need a history lesson. I don't understand. And aren't His all... friend's like, okay. Yeah. No shit. <laughs> I just asked if you knew them. That's all. I just was curious. Where's the bathroom, yeah. dude? What? Like, I did a project about her. <laughs> <laughs> he brings out a diorama. <laughs> <laughs> she was born in Thebes. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's like, um, okay. okay. I'm going to go dance. Um, <laughs> but I did think like, it's kind of interesting how they never explain what this party is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I thought what it was going to be was going to be a celebration of the discoveries that they just found. Yeah. But oh, all right. there is really no connection between that outside of that very interesting transition that we saw. Yeah. And so you start putting these things together in your mind and you're like, Ardith Bay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Ardith Bay. <laughs> has ideas <laughs> yeah that he's currently having at the Cairo Museum yeah that are directly connected with Helen Grosvenor right okay and then we're like how are we going to connect these two yeah yeah separate plot points yes with art <laughs> 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 But in the next scene, a bell tolls outside of the Cairo Museum, where inside Sir Joseph finds Ardith standing solemnly at Oxenamon's section. Sir Joseph tells Ardith that the tolling bells means that the museum is closing, but Ardith admits that he didn't notice the time. Seeing who he's speaking to, Ardith introduces himself, which softens Sir Joseph to the whole, sorry, we're closed thing. Yeah, he went from closing time yeah. to like, you can stay the night if you yeah, want yeah. to. He's like, like, you want us to read it? Like, <laughs> like, oh, it's you. Yeah. Do you want to like move in? Like, that's fine. Picture this. Ardith Bay Museum. (laughs) (laughs) I was like, oh my God. But Sir Joseph goes to shake his hand, but it just lingers there awkwardly, unshaken. So he just instead thanks Ardith for the wonderful exhibit that he facilitated. He does a total 180, as we said, saying that the museum should be opened all night in his (laughs) honor (laughs) and invites him to come down to his office. That's what I'm talking about. It's like, because if you're just a regular dude, it's like, you need to get the hell out of here. Yeah, we're calling the police. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) But Ardith gives a small bow of respect. But when Sir Joseph reaches a hand to Ardith's arm to guide him, Ardith pulls away abruptly. He goes, I beg your pardon. I dislike to be touched. He calls it an Eastern prejudice. And I'm sure it has nothing to do with his skin or yeah. the age of it. Yeah. I'm a little ashy. <laughs> yeah. Don't the grab me. The state of it. <laughs> How brittle it may be. <laughs> it, no, it may or may not be. We don't know. He's Ardith Bay. He's yeah. Ardith Bay. We don't know his skin care. He's made of paper mache. Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 <laughs> Everybody knows it about Ardith Bay. Bars. <laughs> But they walk off together as a museum attendant shuts off the lights. Ardith follows Sir Joseph into his office where they're met by Frank. Frank asks where Ardith disappeared to after the excavation, and Ardith quickly explains that he simply returned to Cairo. He attempts to leave immediately, 
Yeah, he was just cool. <laughs> Frank showed up and he's like, mm-mm, mm-mm. I love how Ardith holds up to one question. Yeah, <laughs> that was and it. He's like, I got to <laughs> I barely had an answer for that. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and <laughs> see you guys tomorrow. <laughs> Sir Joseph invites him to his home. Ardith declines this offer and promptly leaves. <laughs> <laughs> nice office you have here. I'll see you around. Sir Joseph is a bit annoyed at his son for not thanking Ardith for their recent findings, but Frank explains that he thinks it's bullshit that the Cairo Museum is keeping everything that they found. Sir Joseph explains that that was the contract. The British Museum works for the cause of science, not for loot. Everything that who found? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I need, somebody needs to pull Frank aside. You didn't find anything. Yeah. Humble yourself yes. no shit. immediately. <laughs> and I, I laughed because Ardith literally told them where to dig. Yeah. <laughs> Other people dug it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, Jesus. And then I was like, okay, so is this a comment on imperialism? Is that what we're doing? Yeah. Or are we I not mean, doing if anything? It's, if it's, or it could literally be nothing. Yeah. yeah. And Frank is just fucking annoying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But in the next scene, the camera glides past the artifacts in Oxenamen section in the museum. Crouched behind a glass case is Ardith, who reads the scroll of Thoth by candlelight. Yes, folks, Ardith Bay is him a death. <laughs> Get out of here. What? Yes. Right, stop it. <laughs> you mean that mummy's the mummy? Yes. <laughs> what? Oh, wow. I I didn't know I part of me whenever we see him in the door frame yeah it's like that's the escaped <laughs> yeah well I think the hair is supposed to throw percent. you off yes I, I don't know um one thing that I did notice is that even with his skin it looks and I think that they meant to make it appear as though it had been damaged by the bandages mm-hmm. okay and so the first time we see Ardith Bay obviously mm-hmm. yeah but I wonder if there was any in- attempt as a means of concealing this fact yeah because what was the audience supposed to think in 1932 do you think that they knew immediately yes okay (laughs) (laughs) i don't don't know how you don't that's boris karloff (laughs) it's like when a dual role this evening (laughs) boris karloff i did also (laughs) when i was looking up stuff for the film Ardith, (laughs) Ardith bay is an anagram of death by raw Wow. Yeah. yeah. I did not know that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. It's like, I see you. You want to know what's funny is that <laughs> as I was doing it, I was, I, all I saw, I saw Ardeth Bay. Yeah. And I was like, our death, you know, and that's, mm-hmm. that's as far as I got. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for clarifying. <laughs> You're very welcome. <laughs> but as Ardeth begins to chant over the scroll, intercut are shots of Helen enjoying her time at the soiree dancing with an unnamed man and a large smile on her face. But as Ardith chants Anxanamen, Helen grows deathly concerned in her face and stops dancing. Her dancing partner asks if there's something the matter, and she just walks away from him, seemingly in a deep trance. Ardith continues chanting as Helen retrieves her mink stole from the coat check at the front of the party, which was hilarious to me because she's in a deep trance, but she's like, yeah, that one's mine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Still. I'm not fucking I'm not leaving without yeah, my that mink stole. <laughs> it's like, oh, but you can get your coat. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> trans or no trans. You can't say yeah, goodbye. No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we're getting our. <laughs> <laughs> but she steps outside with unfocused eyes, sitting down in the back seat of a waiting car. The driver asks where she wants to go, and she tells him the Antiques Museum in French. The car speeds away as Ardith continues his chants at the museum, now repeating Emotep, Oxenamen. In the back of the car, Helen repeats Emotep and begins speaking in what the subtitles determined to be an ancient language. Oh, all right. The car arrives at the Antiques Museum, and Sir Joseph and Frank watch hilariously from another car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As Helen steps out of the vehicle and steps toward the museum doors in her trance. As she bangs on the door, her vacant voice chants that she must get in. But Frank approaches her and not seeing any of this as strange, just tells her that the museum is closed for the night and everyone has gone home. Listen, we all love antiques. Yeah. I think you're being a little dramatic. Yeah. <laughs> we'll be open in the morning. Yeah. Yes. They can just come, come back. back. Yeah. I think what makes me laugh so much about this is that they, they're they kind of um, seemingly the curators and they're supposed to be kind of in charge of things going yeah, on here. Yeah. Uh, they didn't check to see if Ardith left. 
No, not at all. Oh, yeah. Artists, yeah, yeah he well, can do what he wants. Yeah. <laughs> he owns the museum now. Because <laughs> uh, he's performing a, a, a ritual. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they're just like, all right, lights out. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> so we're getting pizza tonight, or anything. like it's like, what? There's a man in there. <laughs> but Frank reaches out to Helen, but as soon as he touches her arm, she slowly faints. Without hesitation, Frank just scoops her up and takes her to their car. This was kind of strange to me mm-hmm. because I understand that she arrived in a taxi. Yeah. But on what planet is the taxi driver like, no, nah, it's probably fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Every, everything I've just seen, it's probably. On Earth. With the, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> with the chanting in the backseat. Yeah. <laughs> she's cool. Yeah, she she's, knows yeah. what she's doing. She knows exactly what's happening. That I just, that's so funny. They're leaving and then she pulls up. Yes. And they're what the, the timing. Fuck? Yes. Yeah. Ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> I just love that they were both basically half in, half out of the car. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we cut to the Wimples home. Helen lies on a couch, still chanting Emotep and speaking in an ancient language as the two men look after her. Frank asks what the language is, and Sir Joseph explains that it's the language of ancient Egypt not heard on this earth in over 2,000 years. And Sir Joseph recognizes the name Imhotep as the name of a man unspoken since before the siege of Troy. But he should recognize the name Imhotep as the mummy they discovered. Yeah! 10 years ago. (laughs) Because they literally read his name from the sarcophagus. It's not like he wasn't there. He's like, where do I know that? (laughs) I don't know. Well, must be that siege or whatever. What's your cousin's neighbor's name? (laughs) What was that? It was was Emotep, Emotep, right? (laughs) (laughs) But I mean, I feel like this would make a lot more sense if it was something that Norton discovered alone. Right. When when they were out. But literally, Muller's like, Emotep, (laughs) high priest. Like, they have his title. (laughs) They have his title. But all right. (laughs) Back at the museum, a guard stumbles upon Ardith performing his ritual by the light of a candle. But Ardith puts out the candle and blankets the room in darkness. That candle was putting off the fucking light. (laughs) He has more powers than we realize. (laughs) But the guard switches on his flashlight and the camera follows it in a pretty neat moment of cinematography. Mm -hmm. I like that following shot. Yeah. But it finds Ardith crouched behind a glass case. A hilarious but incredibly brief chase ensues after Ardith gathers his things and tries to walk away. The way the guard sneaks up on him, because he literally, the posture is why I ought to. <laughs> what the fuck I is going don't on? know what that was. I also, I died because he turns the light on uh-huh. and Ardith exits on the other, the side. other way and yeah, turns, turns it on. <laughs> <laughs> it's like yeah i can do that too uh, <laughs> you're not special what the I, fuck? I fucking died. <laughs> but after he turns off the light ardith walks off screen only to be followed by the guard who is quickly and loudly <laughs> murdered <laughs> what the fuck dude <laughs> <laughs> quickly and loudly he is yeah. he makes a lot of like death rattles <laughs> yeah. they had said that they wanted to do it off screen because they didn't want to compromise what they had already established with Ardith not being touched right and so if he's seen strangling this man or whatever is yeah. happening it kind of takes away from the brittle <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> if he's able to choke the life out of yeah. the person like, don't touch me yeah, yeah. <laughs> then what is that yeah see i i want what what the what did the other mummy do too and the the good mummy oh, he I, like controlled the sand and he had scorpions <laughs> where is that here what's <laughs> well, yeah, well, well we'll get to it he's only 10 years re- revived yeah. <laughs> yeah. we'll see we you gotta learn shit. yeah <laughs> something something i thought you were talking about um tales from the dark side mummy because he was pretty brutal. yeah he was oh, he was no, but, on his yeah. shit immediately but he was also pretty brittle yeah. <laughs> that's true in the grand scheme yeah. of his one weakness <laughs> so i get it i get it <laughs> but in the next scene muller arrives at the wimple home greeted by a man credited only as the nubian played by noble johnson so this is one of the things that we're talking about as far as not aging quite well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it would have been great to maybe give this character simply a name, a name mm-hmm. to yeah. begin with. 
but I know you had looked up some things on this. I did. I noticed that his skin tone had been darkened. Mm -hmm. Even it's black and white, but you can see. Yeah. So I got a little curious and I looked up Noble Johnson and I read, I was surprised. I read that he founded the Lincoln Motion Picture Company with his brother in 1916. Wow. And it was a black film company that made films geared toward a black audience that had black characters in their films that were fully fledged people and not stereotypes or caricatures. In 1916. In 1916. That's amazing. And the whole company, there was one white guy. Everybody else in the company was black. Wow. And Noble Johnson was the president. Nice. And, um, I read that he was acting in other companies' productions to kind of support his studio Uh and that he resigned as president in 1920 to just focus on acting. And he acted until he retired in 1950 Wow! and lived until 1978. Damn. He died of natural causes at 96 years old. Hell yeah. Isn't that fun? I was like fascinated. No, yeah. that's great. But yeah, in here he's the Nubian. Yeah. I was like, okay. He doesn't get a name. Yeah. And he... Noble. What a fucking amazing oh, that's name. Great name. Like, yeah. But yeah, I was like fascinated. I thought that was so fucking cool. In 1916 to do yeah. that, yeah. that is amazing. I think the thing that disappointed me so much, aside from the lack of, I guess, any kind of character, mm-hmm. is the fact that he has a presence. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But they give him nothing to do, really. Not at all. And it kind of gets like offensive. Yes. Even yeah. more offensive later then, on. Yeah. And I was like, damn it. But yeah, what a cool fucking dude. I mm-hmm. thought that was amazing yeah you would think with somebody with that because you said 1916 and this is 32 yeah Yeah. so some time has passed he's been doing this why wouldn't you want to use his name to let people look i have this big name here and it is helping me a big name yeah Yeah. but maybe it's like you said that nope he didn't want anybody on the same level as boris karlov i don't know i don't don't know. know but it's kind of a shame yeah but he takes Mueller's coat and exits off screen Sir Joseph greets Muller, asking how he knew that Helen was here. Muller says that he found out that she took a taxi from the hotel to the museum, and the watchman at the museum said that she had left in Wimple's car. But Sir Joseph says that before he takes Helen away, he needs to talk to him about something that she said just now. In the parlor, Helen has awakened and is delighted to see Muller enter the room with Sir Joseph. Muller introduces her to everyone in the room, which Helen finds to be too formal under these peculiar circumstances. I don't understand why introducing yourself. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, we don't need to know names. That's, <laughs> so calm down. that's unbelievable. But Muller is ready to take her back to the hotel. But Sir Joseph insists that she rest a little while longer and asks Frank to keep her company while he speaks with Dr. Muller in the other room. As the two men leave, Frank sits down next to Helen, very eager to converse. With a big smile on his face and about to dive into something, Helen interrupts, asking where she was when she fainted. Frank leans in, putting his arm on the armrest of the couch, telling her that she was right outside the museum, and he doesn't know why she was there, and he just laughs and laughs and laughs. Why are you so fucking happy? (laughs) Yeah. I'll admit, I already did not like this dude. Yeah. Already. (laughs) But this, I was like, oh, no. Mm -mm." Yeah. Like, you are way too happy. You're all up in my face. But I did like the couch because it looks like a great couch to just be dramatic on. Like the way she's laying there. That's what I it was built that. for. Yeah, no, yeah. it was great. They used to call them drama couches. I love it. <laughs> I don't think it's quite a fainting couch, no. but it's, it's close enough. Yeah. I, I was a fan. <laughs> but in regard to why she was there, she says that she doesn't suppose why he would know, but she sure wishes that she did. Frank tries to explain why he was there, but Helen suggests that they not talk about it. He goes, oh, right. And they just sit there awkwardly. What? I don't know. <laughs> what do you mean? Uh, it, it just continues like yeah. this. He just stares directly into her face and asks if she's part Egyptian. She tells him that she is and asks how he guessed it. He says he doesn't know. There's just something about her. He explains that he would have liked Egypt a lot better if he had met her there, but he didn't have such luck. He was just stuck in the desert for two months. Not him shooting his shot. Oh, he is. Yeah. I just regained consciousness. Yes. Can I get my mind right? Five yeah. minutes. <laughs> but he's clear- clearly trying to show off because <laughs> he goes, boy, was it hot. That tomb. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ask me about my tomb. <laughs> this is a neon flashing sign. She asks, what tomb? <laughs> 
<laughs> and he goes, oh, you must have heard about the tomb that the princess was found in. Well, she took the bait. <laughs> <laughs> and she did. She realizes that he was part of the crew who found the tomb, which is I'm putting it mildly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you were there. You were there. You were there. Frank elaborates that the 14 steps down the unbroken seal were thrilling, but it was nothing compared to handling the clothes, jewels, and toilet things of the princess. Okay. Toilet things? So this is <laughs> <laughs> this is a, I think, uh, an evolution of the English language through time because Helen uses the same term later, later. Mm-hmm. and she's using it to describe makeup. So like All toilet right. trees. Yes. Okay. So I was going to say, because do, I don't. No, we don't what do that. Are you, <laughs> <laughs> the fuck are you handling um, over yeah, there, Frank? I was like, um. <laughs> A little decorum. <laughs> <laughs> But he reminds Helen that the ancient Egyptians buried everything with them that they used in life. He goes on about to detail the unwrapping of Anxanamen, but Helen interrupts him, asking how he could do something like that. Frank, still jovial, just says, had to. Science, you know? It's <laughs> yeah. like, dude. <laughs> the sheer incapability to read a, of reading a room. Yes. Like, <laughs> he's like, oh, you know, yeah, it was great. <laughs> Should have been there. It was yeah. <laughs> hot. <laughs> hot, though. This that, is my one complaint. That, too. <laughs> but Helen just looks on as Frank shares that going through all of Anks and Amon's things, he felt as if he knew her. And then when they got all of her wrappings off and he saw her face... He kind of fell in love with her. Helen just smiles, jokingly asking if he has to open tombs to find girls to fall in love with. She is handling this way cooler. She she is. Yeah. Because that's terrifying. (laughs) (laughs) What the fuck did you just say? It is. (laughs) We have unwrapped a almost 4,000 year old mummy and he's like, wow. (laughs) That's terrifying. You should have seen her. That's terrifying. (laughs) Oh my god. But realization hits Frank and he slowly sits up straight, realizing what it is about Helen. He says that there's just something about her head that You sure know what to say to him. Yeah, right? You're a peanut shaped <laughs> ass head. What He's like, what? The I don't fuck? I don't know what's happening here. I like, just know, why, dude? What? I don't like it. Yeah, and why are you coming at me like yeah, that? It cuts. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was it. <laughs> yeah, we immediately cut to Sir Joseph's office where he's talking to Muller. Just I was like, all right, yeah. I, honestly, I'm a, a little grateful because I couldn't keep watching that. No, it was <laughs> quite weird. awkward. Yeah. Sir Joseph explains that he heard Helen mutter something in ancient Egyptian about Imhotep. Muller rises from his seat at hearing the name Imhotep and without a second thought, asks Sir Joseph what Ardith was doing in the museum tonight. Sir Joseph says that Ardith was there looking at the mummy and it was just at closing time. Before the men can connect the dots, the phone rings and Sir Joseph answers it. He reacts in shock, speaking in French to the person on the other end before hanging up. He stands up sharply, bidding Muller to follow him, sharing that a museum guard has been found dead in the room of the princess. <laughs> <laughs> they said, and he died loudly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they could tell this way. <laughs> but at the museum, a couple of uncredited guards examine the dead guard on the floor standing up and kind of shrugging. <laughs> They're like, yeah, he's dead all right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you called me. I knew that. We already knew that. <laughs> but with an odd smile, and this is what I'm talking about with Edward Van Sloan. Yeah. Muller is like, so he died of shock. <laughs> it's like, why are well, you smiling? Because yeah. yeah. one of them's like, I can't find a cause of death. He's still on the floor. <laughs> like, yeah. you're not a doctor or no, a coroner. No. Or- That's never been your job. <laughs> yeah, uh, that made me laugh. <laughs> But the first guard holds the scroll of Thoth, saying that it was found in the dead guard's hands. He guesses that a thief tried to steal it, and then the guard tried to take it away and was killed for it. That's when the second guard says that he can't find a cause of death. (laughs) (laughs) So I understand completely that we got to have some theories about what happened here. Right. But the first guard saying that it was an attempted theft... Wouldn't the thief leave with the item? Yeah. Right. If he killed the guard to for get it? it. Yeah. So I guess he can have it. Yeah. Well, I mean, unless he was like, oh, shit, I can't fight back. I'm just going to scare him. You know what I mean? He's like, <laughs> he took the he took the scroll and he was like, oh, shit, you're a mummy. And then he's, <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, it did say he died of shock. That's, yeah. yeah. That's the working theory. Here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I got to be honest. That didn't sound like shock. No. <laughs> No. That sounded More like fright. he was being yeah. strangled. Yeah. <laughs> it did sound like a physical attack. Yes. yes. So, I mean, I know that you didn't want to show him 
doing strangling this. Strangling someone, yeah. but kind of sounded like <laughs> strangled someone. But Sir Joseph agrees that it looks like an attempted theft, but nothing was taken from here that could be disposed of. Muller asks what's in the document, and the guard hands it over to Sir Joseph. He unrolls it, and he can't hide his shock when he realizes that he's holding the scroll of Thoth. So this is very smart screenwriting because with everything that happened in 1921, neither of these men ever even knew for certain that the scroll of Thoth was in that casket. That's a fair point. Only our surrogate Renfield yeah. knew. <laughs> <laughs> they had speculated, and so this is proof. Yeah. Right. But back at the Wimple's house, Frank puts a pillow behind Helen's head, leaning in super close to her as she smiles at him. He rubs her arm and asks if she really wants to know why he didn't take her to the hospital. He says that when he held her in his arms, but she interrupts him, asking hadn't he better not commit himself? She asks what girl could fail to make a conquest who collapsed at a man's feet in the moonlight? Frank just stares deeply into her eyes, telling her that he knows they've only just met, but he's serious. Helen asks if he thinks she's had enough excitement for one evening without the additional thrill of a strange <laughs> a strange man making love to her. <laughs> what the fuck is going on? I don't well, know. I mean, it's exciting. You know, I mean, maybe not in this situation. Okay, yeah. <laughs> well, because it's like, it's been such a short time. The majority of the time we've known each other, I was unconscious. Yeah. Yes. So like already the red flags are red flagging. Yeah, how long I'm, were you watching me sleep? For what the I'm, fuck? This is, you're in love with the fucking mummy. Like, yeah. I'm just, <laughs> this is a lot of information to take in. Helen's like, talk to her. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm very tired. I'm not going to be the other woman. I'll no. tell you that right now. <laughs> I, I'm not going to play second fiddle yeah. <laughs> to a 4,000 year old corpse. <laughs> that is not about to happen. The disrespect. <laughs> <laughs> but frank says that he's never been serious about this sort of thing before and helen just laughs frank tells her look here and says that she can tell him to go to the devil but she can't laugh at him at this point sir joseph and muller return and we see the look <laughs> on both of their faces of just what the fuck yeah <laughs> <laughs> and when the camera returns to the couch Frank and Helen are kissing. He put the Mac down. I don't know. I I mean, mean, I I guess. guess, She's like, the devil, you say? (laughs) She was into it. I I don't like it. Mummy, it couldn't be me. (laughs) (laughs) Sir Joseph responds in worry, saying that the curse has struck Helen, and through her, it will strike his son. I do think that's a bit of an overreaction. (laughs) (laughs) Not to quote the killers, but it was only a kiss. Yeah. (laughs) It was only a kiss. But Muller tells him to to be quiet (laughs) and just asks Frank into his father's study for a conversation. He said, Frank, get off that mummy and go to your room. (laughs) Go to your room. (laughs) He lost all mummy privileges. (laughs) But Frank excuses himself from Helen, turning off the lights on his way out so she can rest. Gives a new meaning to tomb raiding, huh? I mean, <laughs> he's fucking that much. Oh, Jesus <laughs> Christ. I was going to commend you for your decorum, <laughs> sir, but I'm taking that back. I didn't even give it to you. I'm taking it back. <laughs> now you're in the negative. <laughs> you're negative one decorum. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> and get Gizmo out of here. <laughs> well, you brought him with you? <laughs> he's not going to save you this time. No, he doesn't belong here. That was episode 92. <laughs> but in the study and through his research, Muller shares that Emotep was alive when the princess was a vestal virgin in the temple. Frank doesn't see the connection between 3,700 years ago and now, but Muller just talks to Sir Joseph about Norton, saying that he made a transcription of part of the Scroll of Thoth that night. Sir Joseph says that he still has it, but Frank is getting heated, saying that Muller seems to think that this scroll has all the devils of hell in it. I was like, why is he so mad? Yeah. Well, well and again, I'm, I'm really not trying to dogpile on you, T, but I am going to read the next thing that I wrote. <laughs> <laughs> Frank doesn't have patience for any of this. He's just trying to get it in. <laughs> get it in. <laughs> this is the mummy, dude. I didn't- <laughs> the 1932... <laughs> Horror classic. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Can we have not only just a little decorum, but some respect? <laughs> some modicum of some respect. <laughs> I'm dizzy. <laughs> like, I, can't, <laughs> I can't be the only one here. <laughs> just trying to get through this. I just You're want just to entertain. <laughs> I'm sorry. 
<laughs> I take it back. <laughs> <laughs> now that you see how much it's affected me. <laughs> I didn't think that would be the straw. Um, I'm very sorry. <laughs> But Frank asks <laughs> why he doesn't just burn the scroll and be done with it if he thinks it's so evil. Muller isn't counting out that idea, but instead just asks Sir Joseph what became of the mummy Emotep. Sir Joseph doesn't answer, so Frank answers for him that obviously someone stole it. After a moment of silence, Frank asks Muller flat out what is going on with Helen. <laughs> <laughs> he's like i'm getting very attached to <laughs> and i'm very concerned I'm in love. <laughs> yeah. i think we're I'll engaged honest, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but muller asks if sir joseph still thinks that mummy was stolen and for a moment he says that he does before becoming a bit more unsure but when there's a knock at the door the nubian opens it up to find ardith standing there in darkness after a short moment of eye contact ardith's eyes begin to glow slightly he lets himself in, walking forward as the Nubian takes a step back. Ardith begins to chant, which brings the man to his knees before rubbing his face against the ring on Ardith's outstretched hand. Ardith then lets himself into the parlor as the music rises and he finds Helen on the couch fast asleep. He approaches her with wonder and disbelief in his eyes. I did love that she and Frank were just making out they pull Frank into another room and she just goes to sleep. <laughs> well, she said that she was tired that's, or whatever. Uh, that's great. <laughs> but she awakens to see him, confused at the sight of him as he leers over her. He apologizes to her as she reaches her feet, introducing himself as Ardith Bay. She stands to look at him, introducing herself Ardith explaining that he called to see Sir Joseph, and Helen explains that he's in the study. He asks if he could perhaps wait for him here, and she tells him that of course he can. So this entire conversation, they're staring into each other's eyes, absolutely preoccupied, mm -hmm. and barely taking part in the conversation at hand. I did hear in later interviews on that documentary, mm -hmm. Zita Johan said that staring in Karloff's eyes was like staring into shattered mirrors. And she said that they radiated pure sadness. Oh my God. Damn. So I don't know if that is how deeply he was in character. Mm -hmm. I hope so. I bet he dropped his hot pocket before the set <laughs> and he was like, Fuck. he's shattered. Yeah, yeah. He's like, now that's how I get into it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have to be that's sad. Okay. <laughs> Watch Give this. me one second. Yeah. <laughs> Let me microwave this nuclear hot pocket <laughs> <laughs> and drop it. <laughs> um. <laughs> but maybe that's why frankenstein his performance as the monster maybe that's why it hit me so hard yeah because that's all that he had yeah and if that is just the vibe that yeah. he gives mm -hmm. you know i mean he couldn't speak no and I, I think it's just the description of shattered mirrors yeah, yeah. it's kind of brilliant very really sad poetic yeah. and sad but i feel like this is partly where i start to um understand emotep Mm -hmm. yeah and like motivation wise yeah. yeah he becomes more of a sympathetic character than a full outright villain yeah i know he <laughs> murdered a security <laughs> guard <laughs> i'm aware of that yeah. <laughs> he turned off the light behind him he did. Yeah. <laughs> he's saving electricity yeah. yes. he's not all bad you know, <laughs> we do good in this world we yeah. do bad in this yes world. <laughs> <laughs> but ardith inches closer asking if it's possible that they've met before Helen gazes up at him, saying that she doesn't believe so because one couldn't possibly forget meeting Ardith Bay. Ardith says that he must be mistaken then, but he's certain that she must be Egyptian, which she confirms, saying that her mother was. In the study, Muller says that they must burn the scroll of Thoth, but Sir Joseph says that he can't. It's the museum's property, not his. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, oh, really? so you can burn any of my shit yeah. that you want. <laughs> he's like, hey, kill. He ran a red. You can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you gotta you break the rule. Yeah, yeah. there's. Dude, <laughs> we're gonna die. <laughs> there's... It's not mine to give you. I, I don't know what to oh, tell I you. Oh, I can't steal yeah. that. <laughs> there's something supernatural afoot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but through a crack in the door, 
Frank notices that someone is out in the parlor with Helen. He steps over to see and returns to the other men, telling them that it's Ardith Bay. Sir Joseph says that he's come for the scroll and decides to hide it behind some books on his bookshelf before the three men join Helen and Ardith in the parlor. I do want to say he's come for the scroll. There, That has not been established. Yeah. <laughs> no. Ardith just shows up. Yeah. And then Sir Joseph is like, oh, yeah, I called him and told him that, it, <laughs> <laughs> that the scroll is his, even though I just said it belongs to the museum. It's like, what? Yeah. What are you what I are know, you? Yeah. <laughs> I don't understand. <laughs> But when they enter the parlor, Helen and Ardith are just standing there, staring at each other. I like how they all stepped out. Like, they're, they like, were all shook. Stiff. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, yeah, you guys look super cash. Yeah. <laughs> just stepping into the living room. Frank's like, we just kissed. And I said that weird thing. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and now you're staring at this guy. Yeah. <laughs> I've ruined this already. Yeah. <laughs> but Sir Joseph introduces Ardith to Muller. And Ardith says that after accepting Sir Joseph's invitation but finding no solitary student with his books, his visit is inopportune. So it's like, what was? what is this phone call? Yeah. yeah. I don't know. But I feel that a few times in this where I'm like, is, did a scene get cut here? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <Yeah. You know? laughs> I guess it must have. Because I feel <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I did laugh out loud at this part because Muller says, because he says that the visit is inopportune. Yeah, yeah. So Muller replies, on the contrary, they were just talking about... And Ardith goes, me? <laughs> Dude. No joke. <laughs> Be cool. <Yeah. laughs> were you listening? <laughs> His ear to the door. Yeah. But Muller counters. He's native Egypt. And he asks Ardith if he knows Helen. Helen, still in a trance, says that Ardith introduced himself to her. Sir Joseph asks them to take a seat. And they do while still maintaining eye contact. Helen begins to blink slowly, but still stares right at Ardith. Muller begins probing, asking Ardith how he knew where the tomb of the princess was hidden. Ardith explains that it was partly inference, partly chance. He takes notice of Sir Joseph's countenance, saying that he appears disturbed. Sir Joseph says that there was a tragedy at the museum (laughs) right after (laughs) Ardith (laughs) left, which shakes Helen from her trance, and she asks if it happened while she was there. Ardith takes notice of this and is very intrigued to learn that Helen was there and tried to get into the museum. Before she can elaborate, Muller says that it's very late and asks Frank to take Helen back to the hotel. But she says that she doesn't want to go, as she continues staring into the eyes of Ardith Bay. Muller tells her that she needs rest after everything that's happened, and Helen says that while she was tired before, now she's never felt so alive. What? Interesting. Muller says that as her doctor, he orders her to go. Helen just says that she isn't a child, but even Frank begins to plead with her too. Perplexed but transfixed, Helen bids Ardith au revoir, but says that they must see each other again. Ardith simply replies, I shall be honored. As Helen raises her hand, collecting herself momentarily and staring back at Ardith before leaving with Frank. The three men left in the room. Muller explains the murder of the guard at the museum to Ardith. A guard killed by a man who left a gift to the museum. A scroll. Muller says part of it was transcribed when it was first found, and he pulls Norton's paper out of his jacket pocket and shows it to Ardith, who claims that he isn't able to read it. (laughs) (laughs) Sir Joseph calls bullshit, saying that Ardith was able to read the name of Anxanaman off that piece of pottery, so what gives? Interesting, because Sir Joseph was not there for that. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> He's like, I've heard things. Yeah. We were talking in the office. <laughs> it's like, you guys remember Professor Pearson who <laughs> suddenly disappeared for some reason? <laughs> he was there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what is going on? I don't know. But Ardith says that that pottery was from a different period of time than these symbols. Muller continues. The scroll that these hieroglyphics were copied from was stolen 10 years ago, along with the mummy of high priest Imhotep. Ardith says that it's very interesting. (laughs) Interesting stuff. That Imhotep sounds like a real cool cat. (laughs) I I will see you guys later. (laughs) I gotta go, though. (laughs) But he asks Sir Joseph if he can see the scroll, but he lies to Ardith, telling him that they left it at the museum. Ardith doesn't believe it. He just goes, so... (laughs) this 
is hilarious. <laughs> <to me>. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because Muller says that he has something else to show Ardith. And he unveils a photograph of the mummy of Imhotep taken on the day of the excavation 10 years ago. Ardith's like, and he's handsome too? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. wow. <laughs> Seems like the great. The whole package, really. Yeah. <laughs> How could Helen not fall in love with <laughs> <laughs> What chance does a guy like Frank have, right? <laughs> but I laughed because he reacts in a way. He's like, my throwback Thursday photo. <laughs> <Yeah>. But <laughs> <laughs> um, this feels very close to when Dracula with the mirror. The mirror, exactly. Yeah. Yes. It's basically the same scene. Yeah. When he's like, fuck. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he's like, all right, I showed a bit too much back yeah. there. <laughs> But Ardiff asks why Muller is showing all of this to him, and Muller just spills it, asking if he thinks it's possible that the mummy wasn't stolen, but restored to a semblance of life by the spell of the scroll. Ardiff just interrupts him, saying that he bought that scroll fair and square from a dealer. (laughs) (laughs) And that was the chicken that he killed for dinner. (laughs) Uh, What? (laughs) (laughs) What was that last part? Yeah. He then posits that the scroll is here in this house, probably in Sir Joseph's study. He then immediately raises his hand, pointing at Sir Joseph, <laughs> and begins to chant in an ancient language. You need to leave. I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You need to leave. I have not him openly chanting. Yes. Him. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, look, the jig is up. <laughs> Who are we fooling? What's funny to me is that, like, how far we are in the movie that he literally is just giving up everything. Yeah. Yeah. Well, not only that, I mean, I feel like at this point, Frank should have hit him with, like, a vase or something over the head. <laughs> I mean, Run I back mean, in. Yeah. <laughs> was, yeah. Yeah, he just he's like, no, I'll take Helen. Yeah. <laughs> sure. No, we're he's leaving. busy. Yeah, we're fine. We're fine. But Muller just steps in the way, saying that they foresaw this and that the scroll is in safe hands. He says that it'll be destroyed the minute it's known that harm has come to either of them. It's a pretty bold lie because it's just sitting on a bookshelf. Yeah, and he clearly knows it's just sitting yeah. on a bookshelf. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the camera presses in on Ardith, who tells Muller that through his study of their ancient arts, they must know that he can't be harmed. And he also must know that they must return the scroll to Ardith or they will die. Ardith says to tell that weak fool to get the scroll and hand it over to his Nubian servant. Sir Joseph just says, the Nubian. And Muller responds, the ancient blood. I don't know what that means. I don't know. (laughs) Okay. Muller, full of fury, says that Ardith has hypnotized the Nubian servant into becoming his slave then he threatens to break Ardith's dry flesh to pieces if only he were able to get his hands on him. He said, bye, Ashy. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I did not like the slave. No. Um, maybe because he's African. The ancient. ancient blood. Okay. Yeah. That, I that's why I was. Yeah. But, but I don't. Still, yeah. This whole part, I was like, Ugh. Ugh. yeah, yeah. It's Ugh. Weird. I don't like that. Feeling very uneasy. Can we get back to the mummy doing stuff? Like yeah. <laughs> 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 Just doing Just stuff. Doing stuff. <laughs> doing his taxes. <laughs> literally, anything. literally anything at all. <laughs> But there's a frightening shot for a moment of Ardith just staring right at Muller before Muller just admits that Ardith's power is too strong. Ardith just smiles, does an about face, and walks out of the room. I laughed out loud. (laughs) If I could kick your ass, I would, but I can't. I can't. (laughs) So you're you're lucky, pal. We all know that I can't. (laughs) It's like, really, dude? It's like, why am I? (laughs) What? I will say, if you like that shot of Ardith's eyes... Boy, <laughs> do I have a film for you. You are in for a treat. <laughs> and I have to admit, it's a great shot. Yeah, it is. And it makes me think of that shot of Dracula. Oh, yeah. With the beam of light. Yeah. So I'm like, you know, again. And that was recycled too, quite yeah. a bit. And we loved it. So. Mm-hmm. But after Ardith leaves, Muller pleads with Sir Joseph to burn the scroll, saying that that was the evil force that's been attacking Helen, and that it was through Sir Joseph that all this horror came into existence. In all fairness, it was Norton's fault. Yeah, it was. Yeah. So, I mean, I know we're not yeah. supposed to speak ill of the dead, but sometimes <laughs> but you here gotta... we are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but Sir Joseph agrees. He's like, all right, if it'll end war. <laughs> <laughs> In his lair, Emotep. I'm just going to call him Emotep. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I was, I was going to say. Yeah. <laughs> his we cover is blown. <laughs> <the floor>. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I don't refer to him as Ardith anymore. <laughs> Imhotep kneels before a small pool filled with water in his home. Through it, he engages in a little remote viewing, watching Sir Joseph remove the scroll from the bookshelf and hold it in his hands. He immediately takes it over to the fireplace, but before he can light it on fire, Imhotep begins to chant over the water. 
I do want to shout out the cat that's watching all of this happen. Yeah. Yes. A <laughs> new favorite character on Locke. <laughs> um, but it did make me laugh because he's looking at this and it is clear as day and it's exactly where he said it was. <laughs> it's like, I fucking knew it. <laughs> the funny thing is that it's, uh, he's watching uh, from different camera angles too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. His TV pool is oh, amazing. It's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. He's got the director's cut. Yeah. <laughs> But Sir Joseph immediately clutches his chest in pain, his shaking hand dragging him up the fireplace. He gasps for breath, barely reaching his desk and trying to open the drapes. But Emotep squeezes his fist and we watch as Sir Joseph clutches his heart and his collar before dropping to the floor dead. I do want to say in the draft when it was still Cagliostro, Mm -hmm. they had talked about his power to hypnotize people. And ah. so I think this is a holdover. Okay. They're like, he can do it too. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? It's easier than rewriting it, right? Yeah. <laughs> but Emotep comes back to himself after committing this murder, and he watches as the Nubian enters the study. He replaces the scroll in the fireplace with errant papers from Sir Joseph's desk, burning them as a decoy and leaving the house with the scroll in hand. But later, Muller discovers the ashes in the fireplace, telling Frank, who is also there now, that his father destroyed the scroll, knowing it would cost him his life. That was never established. Yeah. (laughs) He, in fact, said, if you don't do this, we will die. Yeah. Yeah. So don't try to make him a hero. (laughs) It's so weird. But Muller pulls a charm of the goddess Isis from his pocket, telling Frank that she's the Egyptian symbol of life, and he says that he meant to give it to Sir Joseph. Frank asks what good that charm could have done as the doctors say that it was a plain case of heart failure. There's no way that you don't see a correlation at this point. Yeah. You're just willfully. You were just with him and he was fine. Yes. I mean, not that things can't happen, you know, seemingly spontaneously, but there's there's no way that you're just like, no, no, no. (laughs) It's like, stop. I don't like it. (laughs) (laughs) I think we're just finding extra (laughs) reasons. And there was, I mean, honestly, in Dracula, he played the unimportant fiance. Yeah. And here he's playing the unimportant, I guess, boyfriend. (laughs) Are they dating? Whatever, yeah. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. But Muller slyly remarks that the Nubian is missing as well. But Frank just chalks it up to him being frightened, saying that he will return. Frank tells Muller not to try to convince him that Ardith is a mummy that's come back to life. <laughs> He's like, don't start that bullshit again. Yeah. <laughs> don't ask again. <laughs> <laughs> but Muller says it was that idea and the horror of it that killed his father. Muller notes that the museum guard died of natural causes too. But then he pleads with Frank that he needs his help, saying that he saw his attraction to Helen last night and her attraction to him. Frank's like, hers to me? You think so? this dude. Does she like like me? (laughs) Your dad's dead. Yes. A mummy's come to life and you're rock hard. (laughs) Oh, God (laughs) damn it. He's hanging on by a thread. (laughs) That is negative two (laughs) on the decorum. No, but that's really what you're worried about right now? Yeah. Yes, like, you, I think you know. Here's what shocked me. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to get past that. <laughs> here's, here's what shocked me. Solid. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's three. Um, <laughs> I thought more time had passed. Right. This was last night. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you're standing yes. where, where yes. yeah. he passed away. And you're like, Helen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk more Let's about talk, Helen, yeah. though. Did you like catch a vibe or like, what do you mean? <laughs> like, I know you weren't there that long. But <laughs> <laughs> what did you think you, though? We kissed though. Do we look good together? It was important. <laughs> <laughs> it's the most important moment of my life. <laughs> of all the treasures I've found in this life. <laughs> <laughs> Helen is, all right. Um, <laughs> Muller says that he welcomes this attraction, even though it's absolutely not his place in the slightest. And Frank asks if Muller thinks he legitimately has a chance because... But then he stops himself, saying that it's such a terrible time for this. But Muller asks Frank to go with him to Helen now and to first telephone her not to leave the hotel. Frank agrees, calling the hotel as Muller gathers pieces of the burned paper from the fireplace and puts them in an envelope. From the hotel, 
Helen says that she has no plan to leave and promises to wait until Frank gets there. I would have no plans to leave either because that bitch looks comfortable. <laughs> yeah. What hotel is this? <laughs> yeah. like, oh my God. Feet up. Like, yeah. <laughs> she's like, nothing happened last night. She's like, I got a crab bisque on the way. I'm not, I'm not about to leave. Uh, why would I leave anyway? I haven't eaten my crab bisque. <laughs> But she apologizes. <laughs> I've done it again. She apologizes to him for the loss of his father. <laughs> I can't. But she scalds him. <laughs> Before hanging up the phone. In a car, Muller analyzes the pieces of paper from the fireplace with a magnifying glass. He determines and tells Frank that his father did not burn the scroll of Thoth. He says what was in the fireplace was pieces of newspaper and the scroll was made of papyrus. At this point, Frank accuses the Nubian of murdering his father, and Muller doesn't put up much of a fight to this theory. Instead, he gives Frank the Isis charm and tells him to put it on, saying that in their fight against Emotep, they must ask protection from the gods that this creature has defied. Frank says he'll give it to Helen since she needs protection, but Muller corrects him that her life isn't in danger. It's her soul that is. He says that if love for Frank should come to Helen, the creature will try to destroy him. He says the charm he's giving him was believed to ward off evil sendings like the one that killed his father. Frank finally takes the charm and puts it in his pocket. I'm like, shut up. Just yeah. take it. I don't What is it, it going to hurt you to fucking take it? I cannot stand this guy. <laughs> but also, I did want to commend someone for finally doing something smart and yeah. analyzing yes. the ashes. Yes. I was like, thank you. Yeah, that, that I'm not going to lie, I was surprised. Me too. Me too. I was like, okay. He had the, you know what I mean? The yeah. know how to go be like, hold yeah, on. Yeah, he's let like, me I don't know sure. about this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is a little too perfect. Yeah. <laughs> um, I did want to talk about something I read in Freeman's article. The first film to use back projection was The Mummy. Oh. What? In 1932. Okay. And you see it in this scene. They sent out a camera crew to photograph Egypt and they projected it onto a screen, mm -hmm. and that's what you see through the windows. That is uh, incredible. Okay. That's really cool. So I was like, that is in everything. Yeah. yeah. So I was just very impressed. That's really cool. But we cut to a very tight shot of Emotep, his eyes <laughs> growing brighter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Again. The mummy knows all yeah. and sees all. <laughs> in town, Helen walks with a large dog to an undisclosed location, knocking on a large wooden door when she arrives. Wasn't she supposed to stay at the hotel? She yeah. was. And whose dog bisque. is that? <laughs> I, look, I don't know whose dog this is, <laughs> yeah. but everyone seems to know this dog. <laughs> yeah, yeah but they that talk about dog didn't seem like he wanted to go. <laughs> no, he didn't. No, yeah. of course he doesn't. I will say the dog's name is Wolfram. Yeah. All right. That's incredible. That's pretty uh, great. Yeah. There's also a cat we spoke of. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> we spoke of. Well, I love this cat so much. And the cat, there's a very funny moment with this cat. Yeah. yeah. That is explained later. <laughs> <laughs> but the door opens and we find the Nubian standing there who invites both Helen and the dog inside. Deeper into the residence, Helen walks into a room and finds Emotep standing there. The dog begins to bark at him because animals always know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But a nearby white cat that we've only seen once before. Yeah. Hisses. And I think they forgot to mic the cat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know what happened. It's the suggestion. Yeah. <laughs> the suggestion of a hiss. Like, we don't need to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> you all know what a cat yeah. is. Like. This is the end of Lost in Translation all over again. Yeah. <laughs> But Emotep remarks that Helen's dog is frightened and asks her to leave him with the Nubian, which she does. But after the dog is gone, Emotep invites Helen to sit down. She surveys the rather ornate room of artifacts in older architecture. She seems overjoyed, remarking, Ancient Egypt, nothing modern. They kneel before the magic pool together as incense burns, which Helen makes mention of. Emotep asks if it's familiar to her, and she quickly says that it isn't before he explains that their forefathers used it, his and hers. He leans in closer to her and tells her that she won't remember what he's about to show her. He waves his hand over the water, telling her that he's going to awaken memories of love and crime and death. That's how you intro him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But fog begins to rise from the water as the camera rises above Emotep and Helen, 
giving us a bird's eye view of the clouds of smoke. They clear, and we see a vision inside, one of the time of Emotep's first life. Now, I thought this was really cool. Yes. For yeah. 32, I was like, how did they even do that? It's amazing. Yeah, it looks really, really good. It does. I honestly can't wait for you to, <laughs> for you both to see what they do in The Invisible Man. Mm -hmm. You're going to be like, I'm what excited. the hell? Yeah. But Egyptians crowd around the bed of Princess Anxanamen. We see Emotep at her side as she lies there and he holds her hand. He's like, damn, look how good my skin looks. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, this is what 4,000 years does to him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but in the present day, <laughs> he explains that he knelt by the bed of death. We then cut to a massive procession after the princess's death, a ceremony of community, dance, ritual, and burial. They carry Oxenamon's sarcophagus into a tomb where it's blessed by Amenophis, the pharaoh and the father of Oxenamon, played by James Crane. So they pointed out something on commentary as well. This is the first of the universal horror films to have elements of an original score. Okay. Freund enlisted James Dietrich to compose 20 minutes of music for the film. Mm -hmm. And there's parts of it interspersed. Like whenever um, Emotep is in the museum doing his curses. Yeah. <laughs> that's Dietrich's music. Okay. But this section, he didn't like Dietrich's music. Mm -hmm. And so he used stock music from Heinz Romheld, who would go on to score The Invisible Man. Oh, okay. okay. It all comes together. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but after the sarcophagus is placed inside the tomb, Emotep rushes everyone out. Alone, he finds the scroll of Thoth in a somewhat secret hiding spot under the statue of an Egyptian god. He explains that he knew the scroll could bring the princess back to life. But just as soon as he snags it, the statue above him moves in a threatening manner, almost a warning, but Emotep just runs off with the scroll anyway. He absconds with the scroll to Oxenamon's tomb, kneeling at her side and attempting to read the resurrection spell. But before he can, he's found and seized by guards for doing something so unholy. We see a short trial, if we can even call it that, as Emotep kneels before the pharaoh, who condemns him to a nameless death, with the scroll to be buried with him as to not create the opportunity for this to happen again. Guards lead Imhotep to his own mummification, which he suffers through, completely alive, struggling against the wrappings as they pull cloth over his body and face. He's lifted, still struggling, and placed into a sarcophagus, a couple of workers placing the lid on top of him. They gotta work out. That's yeah. a stone lid. That's <laughs> two of you motherfuckers. It, <laughs> it took three to lift that little casket lid. Uh, they <laughs> and they're like, no, we got this. And they were struggling. <laughs> but men soon crowd over the sarcophagus, defacing it and giving Emotep a nameless burial. The pharaoh overseeing the funeral procession in the dead of night with Emotep and the scroll of Thoth being dumped into a hole and buried in the dirt. So... I wanted to commend the art direction of this film mm -hmm. because in this section you see so much of ancient Egypt. Yeah. All the walls, hieroglyphics. Yeah. The art direction was led by a Hungarian artist named Vili Pogany. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you see all this attention to detail in the paintings, even in the scroll itself. Mm -hmm. And I know I said Hungarian, very congested. Mm. <laughs> I've, I'm drifting <laughs> in and out. <laughs> I didn't even catch it. I did. <laughs> <laughs> Hungarian. But um, I just think that it's very, it's top notch. Yeah. yeah. But Imhotep explains that after he was buried in a nameless grave, the slaves who dug his grave were killed so no one would know. And the soldiers who killed them were also killed so that no one could creep to the desert with funeral offerings for his condemned spirit. I was like, God damn. Yeah. That's a lot. I just, it's just so messed up because the Pharaoh's like, no, them too. Yeah. Like, that's yeah. crazy. Yeah. Now, th this this is not true, but he it is true that he is buried in an unmarked location. Emotep? Yeah. So they have not found his grave whatsoever. That's... Or the last time sad. that I checked, uh -huh. like, that there, it has not been discovered yet. That's very interesting. That's yeah. sad, because he, he was influential, right? Yeah. Right. I think it was so that no one would mess with his mm. grave. I was very surprised in this sequence that we see spears through yes. people's chests. It was pretty rough. I was yeah. like, this is 1932. Yeah. yeah, when the other death was fucking off screen, <laughs> yeah. loud, but off screen. <laughs> yeah. Well, the lights were off. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I do want to say, I, I know this was pre-code. 
films. Mm -hmm. So it was like a really short period of time when films were talkies. Yeah. But before they had any kind of system that I guess regulated what was shown and not. So you have, I think it's from 27 to 34 where films are just either accepted and released or they're not. Mm, okay. And I think the Hayes Code was in 34 to 68. I just remember the Hayes Code because of Hitchcock, like, fucking with them. Yeah. And me thinking that was the coolest thing ever. <laughs> you couldn't kiss for longer than three seconds, so Hitchcock would have people kiss for two seconds, like, 50 times. That's great. <laughs> That's, like, wow, so... Well, I mean, cool, yeah. sometimes yeah. you have to shine a light and be like, do you see how ridiculous this is? Yeah. yeah. And it was. Yeah. Not that the MPAA is any better. No, <laughs> no shit. <laughs> but Helen just sits there at the pool with Emotep, perplexed at what she's just witnessed. But at the conclusion of this story, Emotep calls Helen by the name Anxanaman, and he tells her that his love has lasted longer than the temples of their gods. This is me again realizing what he's done. <laughs> yeah. Is it really that bad? <laughs> Well, <laughs> I say we let him go. <laughs> no, um, well, well, <laughs> let's, let's, let's hear what he has to say first. Like, yes. Hold yeah. on. Well, I was just like, if he wants to, he will. Am I right? <laughs> like, <laughs> But Helen raises her head almost in a trance at his words, and she turns to look at him as he speaks. He says, no man has ever suffered the way that he has for her, but the rest she may not know. Not until she's about to pass through the great night of terror and triumph. Until she's ready to face moments of horror for an eternity of love. Until he sends back her spirit that has wandered through so many forms and ages. Maybe not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> that, was, that was a quick 180 for me. Yeah. <laughs> I will admit. So at this point... <laughs> That silent film cat is like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> fuck this, yeah. and, and leaves. And so that's what I, <laughs> oh no. Yeah. yeah. It's like, I was on your side. Yeah. Silent <laughs> film cat. But that's what I thought. I was like, this cat's just getting out of here. Yeah. We learn more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but this is the part of the film where there was supposed to be scenes of Oxenamen being reincarnated through the years. Okay. And there was a scene that Nay and I talked about off mic. Yeah. With, um, I think she was being martyred, one of her incarnations. Right. And they led her through cages and into a lion's den. Mm -hmm. And when they filmed this, Carl Freund and the cinematographer were behind cages and they led her in there. What? Zeta Johan. And Why? Because I don't know. Because he didn't like her, I think. Because you put her in this horrible danger. You're under safety precaution. Yeah. You put her in this cage and then you don't even use it. Yeah. The footage isn't in the film. There's well, no, no other. Yeah. I, there's no yeah, other. I didn't see that. Yeah. No, <laughs> would've, we didn't. Yeah, no, I would have remembered <laughs> that. <laughs> like, holy there's shit. There's no other explanation for why you would do that. Yeah. And not like take any kind of precaution for her safety. That's It's like crazy. he was trying to traumatize her. That's what it. I from, just don't get it. From yeah. over here, that's what it looks like. Yeah. No, that's what it sounds like. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but Emotep says that before he can do this, Bast must send death to the boy for whom love is creeping in her heart. So a, I did a quick Google search of Bast at this moment, and it all made sense. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but we'll explain in a moment. Yes. But he says that her love for Frank would keep her from him and may even bring sickness and death to her. And again, I've, I've, I no longer support this man. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> you, you went too far. Yes, yeah. but he waves his hand over her face and awakens her from her trance. Coming back to herself, she asks if she's been asleep, saying that she had such strange dreams, dreams of ancient Egypt, and that someone like him was there. Emotep lies poorly with a smirk, saying that his pool is sometimes troubled and that people see strange fantasies in the water but they pass just like dreams. <laughs> that doesn't explain anything. Yeah, not at, at all. all. I'm even more scared now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Not even a little bit. So I noticed Dracula, Frankenstein, mummy. Right. These men just want to be loved in a weird way. Very toxic. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, very toxic. But th they just want, f you know, f uh, what did we call him? Fred, because Frankie is his yes. dad. <laughs> Frankenstein is, is my father. Right. Um, but... <laughs> He just wanted to be accepted. He mm -hmm. wanted to be loved. 
Dracula wanted a good, you know, real estate and, you know, <laughs> multiple partners. Uh-huh. Um, but he wanted to, to feel important and be loved. Yeah. It seems like the mummy is just like, look, I want my old lady back. All right. Yeah. It's been a long time. My skin's bad. You know, <laughs> I need somebody with me. <laughs> but it's very toxic. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's very, very, toxic. very bad. And I think, it's sad. Yeah. You know, that's something that is you know could have been a pure intention yeah can become so corrupted Mm -hmm. um yeah it's it's sad it's fucked up i think that's what's difficult is because if you if you just look at it on paper yeah he loved the princess she loved him yeah she died he tries to bring her back to life her father kills him he comes back to life four thousand years later yeah all he wants is the princess back yeah if that's it, yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, but when he's like, and you gotta kill your boyfriend, yeah. <laughs> kill him for me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, oh my I'm, God. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, my boyfriend's <laughs> loose. We met yeah. the other yeah. day. That's true. That's true. Yeah. But we, you've lost me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but suddenly, Helen's dog begins to yelp and cry out from the other room. So she rises to her feet and rushes to him. Emotep just watches her go from the doorway and we fade to black. We fade in on Frank pacing at the Mullers just as Helen arrives back. He asks her where she's been and that they've been worried and looking for her. Helen asks if they've been at the museum and Frank says that that's right. And in fact, that's where Muller is currently searching. What though? Like you said you were going to wait here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I think what confuses me is why is she asking about the museum I at don't all? Know. Yeah, because that's not where Emotep is. No, yeah. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> but Helen says that if she must give an explanation, it was stuffy in here and she needed some air. Also, not too into this clingy behavior and being watched constantly. Mm. Plus, how'd you get in here? I bribed a doorman. <laughs> 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 but she says that she took the dog with her. But when Frank asks where the dog is, there's an odd moment of confusion and realization as Helen admits that the dog is dead. What? Uh, uh, What the fuck, dude? They killed Wolfram? Yeah. I'm sad. I know. (laughs) What happened? Helen doesn't know how, and she doesn't remember where, but she remembers a white cat standing on the dog's back. Frank knows immediately a white cat the cat goddess, Bast. Helen then remembers seeing a statue of Bast, and Frank calls her the goddess of evil sendings. That's wrong. It's very it's wrong. wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it's wrong. Again, same. I was like that. I was like, that's not right. Right. The goddess Bass is the goddess of pleasure, fertility, and cats. Also of protection, the bringer of good health. I don't. What are you talking I about? I love that cats are yeah. lumped in with. Well, yeah, all these hold on. Well, we love cats. <laughs> yes, we do. Fantastic. Yes. All positive things. Yeah, one thousand percent. It's so weird to be like protection, uh, cats, evil, <laughs> sending. <laughs> what the fuck? Same thing. It's like that never happened. Yeah. But at the same time, I guess they were like, "Well, we want a cat in the film." Yeah. I mean, I who mean, doesn't? We all want I'm cats thankful. in everything. Yeah. yeah. But um, maybe don't get it that wrong. Yeah. Maybe don't yeah. lie. <laughs> But Frank grabs Helen by the shoulders, trying to get her to remember what happened, but she doesn't want to, and she says that it's none of his business. He tells her that it is because they know <laughs> they know that she was with Ardith Bay. <laughs> <laughs> you can call him Imatev. Yeah, no. <laughs> you don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> but they sit down together, and he holds her by the hand, telling her that he loves her and that he's just trying to help and protect her. She begs him not to let her go with Ardith, She says no matter what she does or what she says, and she says that she feels that there's a death for her that will mean a life for something else inside of her that isn't her, but it's alive too and fighting for life. She begs Frank to save her from it. Frank just smiles broadly and tells her that everything's going to be all right. Now that she's asked for help, he'll never leave her alone. That's a direct quote. (laughs) What? what? Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> he is way too happy. Yeah, and he's way, always way too fucking happy. But he's way too confident. They don't know what the fuck is no, happening. No, not at all. Did you set this up so I would ask <laughs> you? For what the fuck? <laughs> you really let that fucking mummy come back to life? <laughs> Kill these people so I would date you Seems or yes. ask you to very, help me? Very calculated. Yeah, he's like, I saw you across the way at a Burger King, <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, man, this restaurant sucks. Uh, <laughs> 
But all right, that no, that's <laughs> enough. Cut his mic. <laughs> I, I'm. This is my fan fiction. <laughs> <laughs> But he says that he'll get Mrs. Muller down here with her, and he'll stay until the doctor arrives, then go to his house. I was like, what? <laughs> so you're not staying. <laughs> it's like, and I need to get groceries. Get and, yeah, maybe brush my teeth. Shower. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, why do we have your whole what the fuck, plan dude? for the evening? What are you talking about? We have to stop that mummy. <laughs> it's more important than you going home for a minute. <laughs> Need a change of shirt. Man. <laughs> but he holds her, <laughs> saying that it's been such torture without her and that he loves her. He loves yeah. her. He loves her. I was just, I was okay. in disbelief. Yeah. Like, I can't believe that you expect that we believe <laughs> that this is, you know, anything. All right. Yeah. I will say sometimes you just know. But I will also say, <laughs> she's been sleeping for most of this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's very strange. Yes. <laughs> Red flags. <laughs> but we cut to Helen resting in bed with Frau Muller, played by Catherine Byron, seated at her side and being looked after by a nurse, played by Florence Britton. So Catherine Byron, who plays Frau Muller, mm-hmm. she was married to the actor who played Sir Joseph at the time. Oh, oh all right. just a little interesting. That's nice. cool. But in the background, in the other room, we see an uncredited doctor talking to Frank and Muller. Helen isn't a fan of this doctor and asks Frau Muller to see what he's saying about her. When Frau Muller leaves, the nurse closes the door behind her. And as soon as she does, Helen sits up in bed, speaking in hushed tones that the nurse needs to help her escape and that she's being held here against her will. The nurse shakes her head, reminding Helen that she told her when these fits come on, she shouldn't listen to them. Helen says that she has a rich friend who will give her money to help her escape, but the nurse just tells her to lie down. Her friend will give her mummy. (laughs) (laughs) That's good. (laughs) Helen continues bargaining to no avail, then just collapses into sobs, saying that she'll die if she doesn't get away. Frau Muller returns to comfort Helen with the nurse. So there's like these moments of clarity. Mm -hmm. If she has enough to say, look, if I say anything, don't listen to me. Yeah. And then immediately like, I got to get out of here. (laughs) I will give you money to get me the fuck out of here. But in the other room, the doctor says that Helen is too weak to move except to a hospital. But Muller insists on keeping her here for observation. I'm going to be honest. I understand that Muller is a doctor. Yeah. I don't know what kind of doctor he is. I know that he has the expertise to evaluate whether or not a mummy has had (laughs) (laughs) its viscera removed. (laughs) But that's the extent. Yeah. And apparently Helen's a patient of his. Yeah, but that's never been elaborated on either. No. No. That, yeah. ma- that makes it sound like it's more psychological. Yeah. yeah. That- I don't know. <laughs> I don't know either. And then we're calling in another doctor to get a second opinion. Yeah. yeah. But he's like, no, keep her here. I'm also a doctor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't what know. What is happening? I don't know what's going on. But Frank is annoyed, saying that Helen is getting weaker by the day and the doctor hasn't given them any guidance on what to do. In the bedroom, a calm Helen asks Frau Muller to bring her a negligee that she bought in Paris as well as her toilet things because she wants to be made up to look well. So again, toilet things. Yeah. Yeah, I just don't like the way that sounds. <laughs> no, it's, it it's doesn't odd. sound yeah. good. Yeah, yeah, I see why it's changed. Yeah. <laughs> but Frau Muller says that the nurse would never allow this and Helen says that they can just get rid of her then. <laughs> <laughs> what so we'll the fire fuck? her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. But she says that it'll be a plot just between them. She says it'll be a surprise for Frank and asks Frau Muller to bring her to him. So this feels like she's hatching a scheme. Yeah, absolutely. Very clearly. Go get Frank, which means you leave the room. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Leaving me alone. Yeah. We continue. (laughs) (laughs) In the other room, the doctor admits that he's failed to make a diagnosis. And Muller says that medical science is useless in a time like this. He is smirking. (laughs) <laughs> yeah i don't get it this isn't funny dude I don't know. <laughs> helen is 
Helen is going through it. Yeah. <laughs> She's dying, dude. <laughs> yes. She's getting this weaker by the day. <laughs> this isn't funny, dude. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, well, medical science. Yeah. It's just like, dude, if you don't get that smile. <laughs> I just don't get it. (laughs) (laughs) But Frau Muller enters the room, telling Frank that Helen has requested him and asks him not to be cross with her for what she's allowed Helen to do. So Frank heads into the bedroom, and instead of seeing a curtain whipping in the breeze, (laughs) (laughs) I know that's what I expected. Yeah, no shit. I thought she was just gone. Yeah. She sits there dressed. He tells her that she shouldn't have done this and they shouldn't have let her. But she asks just this once because it could be the last time. I was like, let her do what? Sit up and yeah, wear makeup? I don't, I don't understand what she did. She's sitting up and wearing, <laughs> <laughs> wearing makeup. Wearing her toilet. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> Frank assures her that she's going to get better and says he knows that he can make her love him and that he can make her happy. They kiss and Muller walks in, stopping very awkwardly in the doorway. Helen says that she does love Frank, and she's trying to prove it, and she says that she'd rather die than live and lose him. (laughs) Okay. I think we all know how I feel about it. I'll just be be quiet. Nay is not shipping this couple. (laughs) (laughs) You sure you want to do that for Frank? (laughs) You sure about that? (laughs) Frank? Just point point in his face. This Frank? (laughs) Frank assures her that she's going to live and they're not going to lose each other. Muller steps in and Helen asks him not to scold her, saying that she just wanted to look her best again. Muller knows exactly what's going on, though, and commends Helen on her insight, saying that the pull to go to him is too strong to withstand and live. Helen says that she's glad Muller understands, but Frank just sits there absolutely confused. Muller says that Helen knows... She knows that the moment she stops struggling, he will give her back all her strength to come to him. But Helen says that she doesn't want to lose her own mind and become someone else, someone she hates. But Muller explains that while she was growing worse, they tried to find Ardith Bay and failed. You can stop using that name at any time. (laughs) You know who he is. Yeah. It's not Ardith Bay. No, No. I stopped like six pages of script ago. (laughs) but he asks her to go to him the next time he calls for her. Frank follows Muller out and asks him what to do. Muller admits they can't do anything. Ardith Bay has beaten them. (laughs) (laughs) But the next time that Ardith Bay calls out to her, they can follow Helen to him and they'll destroy him. All right. (laughs) You don't sound too confident. No. (laughs) But in the next scene, Frank sits in a room, casually smoking a cigarette and reading the newspaper. The nurse enters the room to tell him that she's given Helen bromide to help her sleep and bids him good night herself. Frank goes back to wait in the room, but remembers his charm that Muller gave him. He remembers the charm, but he doesn't remember what Muller <laughs> told him to do with it. <laughs> because he foolishly removes it from his neck placing it on the doorknob of Helen's room to protect her. Mm-hmm. When she doesn't need it, not at all. he right. does. Kind of like, like, did we not learn anything from Constantine? Uh, yeah. What the yeah. fuck? What? Just listen, just yeah. wear it, just, just shut it up. Yeah. yeah. You haven't seen 2005's Constantine? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Get your shit together, guys. <laughs> Come on, man. Jeez, Frank. Really, Frank? It's another strike against Frank. <laughs> <laughs> Frank retires to a couch and falls asleep. But we cut to Emotep, perched over his pool with Bass the Cat hanging out nearby. He, <laughs> Emotep was just waiting for this moment. Yeah. Yeah, he's back on his bullshit for <laughs> yeah. sure. He begins to chant an ancient language with anger filling his eyes, and we watch as Frank awakens, clutching his heart as Emotep squeezes his fist. Frank stumbles into the hallway, reaching out for the charm on the doorknob, snatching the Isis pendant off of it before collapsing. We get that tight shot of Emotep's face again, his eyes glowing as Helen's bedroom door opens. So again, this is a great sequence. Yeah. Yeah. I love love everything about it. Yeah. (laughs) No notes. (laughs) (laughs) But Helen steps out and over Frank's body, walking slowly out of the house and reaching the museum. 
And after a shot of yet another dead guard lying on the floor, we see Helen seated before Imhotep. And she's now fully dressed as the ancient Egyptian princess, Oxenamen. Did he get her a wig? That was part of it. (laughs) (laughs) They talked about the wig on commentary and they said that was one of their major complaints was that it wasn't of high quality. Yeah. Because it's not. But (laughs) it does the job. Well, where's this mummy going to... Where do you get his hands on a high quality wig? You know? He's royalty. It's not his fault. Uh, He was something. He He was a high priest. I don't know. Not now. Look, if you can well, if you can raise the dead, you can get a good <laughs> Yeah, there you go. <laughs> like if we were comparing skills, I'd I say guess, that scroll can help you get a good order. Or? <laughs> I guess that's a fair point. Yeah, the last part of the scroll is about wigs. <laughs> <laughs> but Helen asks him where they are, realizing that she's resting in her bed, but she says that it isn't the temple or her father's palace. Emotep tells her not to look and to not be afraid. She says that she was afraid as he knelt beside her bed and a veil came over her eyes of darkness. Imhotep explains that these were Oxenamen's last memories of him as he knelt by her bed 3,700 years ago. She repeats his words. No man has ever suffered for a woman the way he has suffered for her. She reaches out to him, saying that now that the gods have forgiven them, but Imhotep rises up, interrupting her. The gods, the, they're still pissed. Like, I, don't know, like, I don't know about that it's part. Not done. It's not done yet. <laughs> he tells her that her soul is still an immortal body and has been renewed many times since they were in love in Thebes and that their love won't return to them again until the great change. She doesn't understand, but he simply tells her to look. She stands beside him, staring into a large glass case that holds her sarcophagus. She recognizes it as her coffin made for her by her father and angrily asks which mummy has usurped her eternal resting place. Imhotep tells her that it's her shell. He says that he attempted to raise it from the dead and could even do so now, but it would be a mere thing that moved at his will without a soul. He shatters the glass, removing the mummy and placing it in the corner of the room in an alcove like a fireplace. The mummy is very light, by the way. He he carries it on like two fingers and just... (laughs) Again, nobody can touch you. Yeah. You can strangle someone. (laughs) You're super strong. Yes. But you're brittle? Apparently. I don't... He plays like an empty cardboard box. He just (laughs) (laughs) just puts it there. (laughs) But he brings a candle over to it, reminding her that it wasn't just this body that he loved. It was her soul. He says that if he destroys this mummy, she'll take its place for a few moments and then she'll rise again as he has. He touches the flame to the mummy's feet and watches as the fire catches, burning brightly and fully. He tells her to follow him and they step into another room of the museum where they find the Nubian stirring a concoction. Helen realizes where he's taken her, the room of embalmment. She says it's not lawful for a priestess of Isis to see or be here, but Imhotep simply invites her to the altar of Anubis, the guide of the dead. I don't think we're supposed to be here. Uh, no, I don't think we're supposed to be doing this. Yeah. <laughs> so look, Sir Joseph said this is my museum. Yeah. <laughs> I can do whatever I the fuck do I want. Whatever I want. <laughs> that includes burning the, <laughs> burning the artifacts. Ar- <laughs> <laughs> and making new ones. Yeah. <laughs> but she follows without trepidation. And there... A candle burns in decorative sculpted hands. Imhotep holds her arm, telling her that the time has come for a final prayer. Confused, she asks what this has to do with Anubis, but looking down at her arm, sees that she's been smudged with something. She backs away as Imhotep tells her that the ancient rites must be performed over her body, and then he'll read the great spell from the scroll of Thoth, and she'll rise again as Anxanamen. She immediately changes her mind, reveling in her youth and refuses to die. She tells Emotep that she did love him once, but now he belongs to the dead. She's like, oh, mm -mm -mm. no, we're not (laughs) going to be doing that. She changed her mind quick. She did. And you can pinpoint the exact moment. (laughs) Oh, you got (laughs) to kill me? You know what? Mm, I don't know about that. I know a guy called Frank. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's right. I'm like in love or whatever. (laughs) Fuck, I got to go. He's not trying to kill me. (laughs) He wins. But she proclaims that she is Anxanaman, but she's someone else too. And she wants to live, 
even in this strange world. Emotep reminds her that for her, he was buried alive, and all he's asking is one moment of agony, saying it's the only way they can be united. She's like, yeah, sorry mm. about that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know? I mean, you know. Shit's crazy. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, Nicole, she was already dead. Nobody asked you to do that. That is true. Yeah. That was... I mean, she didn't. Yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. He just really took a lot of things upon himself. Yeah. <laughs> and now you're putting this on me? I did laugh because it's starting to get really awkward in here, and the Nubian just continues stirring like, don't mind me. I didn't, I'm not I didn't, listening. Yeah, I don't know no. anything. This is all your business? <laughs> But Helen realizes that he is stirring the bath of natron. In ancient Egypt, I read that this was a mixture of soap, ash, and oil. Okay. And it was used to cleanse the bodies before mummification. All right. Oh. Nice. <laughs> so she's, yeah. It's time. <laughs> <laughs> she knows exactly what's going yeah. on. But she refuses to have her body plunged into this mixture. But Imhotep says to let the deed be done. The Nubian grabs a ceremonial dagger and chases after her as she runs away. He seizes her quickly, and she begs him to save her, reminding him that she's a princess of Isis. Imhotep merely raises his hand, showing his ring to the Nubian, which causes him to slink away. Anxanaman approaches Imhotep, telling him calmly that she no longer fears him and to do with her what he will. These what? mood swings. I know. What the I'm fuck? like, I feel like you are whoever benefits you in that moment. Yeah. <laughs> She's I like, thought... oh no, I'm Helen now. Get me out of here. It's like, no. <laughs> yeah, you gave I up don't... real fast. I'm yeah. so confused. <laughs> well, what I thought, again, every single time that she does stuff like this, I think it's part of a scheme. Right. But it's and not. And then she's like, no, right here, you see? <laughs> 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 Just dunk myself in yeah. there. Like, <laughs> fantastic, <laughs> fantastic. But back at Muller's house, Muller takes a casual stroll down the hallway to, <laughs> to find Frank knocked out on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> he wakes Frank up, telling him that Helen has gone to him and they must be at the museum. I said, how could you know that? Yeah. But cause especially since the museum is not even where he's been hanging out. No. If it had been. Maybe. And that yeah. would make sense for her to be like, well, is anyone at the museum? Yeah. yeah. If he's been living there. <laughs> but he hasn't. And all his stuff is there. You should. <laughs> <laughs> but Muller says now that he knows his horrible plan, Emotep is going to kill Helen and make her a living mummy like himself. How? Where'd you get that from? Yeah. <laughs> he read the last few pages <laughs> of, of this screenplay. <laughs> But he pulls Frank to his feet. While at the museum, Imhotep grabs the ceremonial dagger, holding it in his hands and proclaiming that the gods will receive the spirit of Oxenamen into the underworld. But not for long. <laughs> it's like, don't be cracking jokes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's psych. <laughs> yeah. Anubis ain't gonna like that shit. No. 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 <laughs> <laughs> he says that Osiris will release her soul. The music grows ominous as he approaches her body, telling her that she'll rest for now, like the setting sun in the west, but she'll rise again in the east as the first rays of Amon Ra dispel the shadows. It's like, this is great writing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, <good>. yeah. <laughs> Muller and Frank arrive at the museum where they see smoke rising from the chimney and they rush inside immediately. You are being very generous using the word rush. Yeah, yeah that's true. Because <laughs> like, what's that? I'm like, why are y'all yeah. <laughs> <y'all> moving so <laughs> slow? Well, Knees to chest. It was the same as a security guard earlier. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sneaking up like a video game. <laughs> <laughs> but Imhotep holds the dagger above Helen's body as they chant together in an ancient language. Now inside, Frank calls out to Helen, which causes her to sit up. After recognizing a statue of Isis nearby, she falls to her knees, begging the goddess for help after confessing to breaking her vows. She cries out to Isis to teach her the ancient summons and the holy spells that she's forgotten as Imhotep approaches her from behind with the dagger. The men casually stumble into the room, and before they can make sense of what they're seeing, Imhotep wards them off with an ancient spell. They just stand there, shielding their eyes, as Imhotep returns to Oxenamen slash Helen. He literally holds up his hand. Yeah. They see a shiny ring. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. They're like, that's enough. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I guess we're staying put. Yeah. <laughs> she raises her hands to the statue of Isis, praying in an ancient language that stops Imhotep in his tracks. The statue raises its arm, holding a symbol in her hand, which flashes a bright light that sets the scroll of Thoth on fire. Imhotep stands there, defenseless and oddly accepting of it all. With the spell broken, his face decays before our very eyes. 
a skull shown briefly as we hear him crumble into nothing. This looked amazing. Yeah, oh, it yeah. looked really good. Frank rushes over to Helen, who has once again fainted. He holds her in his arms, and Muller tells Frank to call out to Helen. <laughs> he says Imhotep has taken her back to ancient Egypt, and he must call her because her love for him may bridge the centuries. I have to say very quickly, <laughs> this line, if this relationship was yes, better, yes. that's one of the loveliest lines I've ever heard in my entire life, Yeah, but, but I don't like Frank. It's wasted. <laughs> it's wasted yeah. on, on Frank. Are you going to talk about how Frank calls yeah, her Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> if this is... This is <laughs> I have Frank calls her name, begging her to come back. Beg is... He's, uh, yeah, yeah, come back. It's Frank. I was like, yeah. <laughs> it's now the it's Frank is very funny. <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, you're not the mummy? Come back. Come back. Yeah. It's, it's Frank. Frank. It's like, ooh. I was like, dude, he just said she's in ancient yeah. Egypt right now. I will tell you right. Implore your love to come back to you. I He's will just tell like, you. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's Frank. Right now, um, recognizing... <laughs> <laughs> Recognizing the voice of your partner. <laughs> <laughs> I I would ne- I would hope <laughs> that, that you I don't would have ne- to- <laughs> yeah, that I would never have to say Jules come back. It's Travis, by the way. <laughs> Remember this that is- dude you're in love with. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is Travis speaking. <laughs> And hello, hello, operator. That's like, what he does. That is bonkers. Come back. <laughs> it's, it's Frank. Frank. <laughs> <laughs> but knowing who it is now she opens her eyes <laughs> it, i mean it worked yes whatever and she's returned to herself and to frank yeah the scroll burns to ashes and the camera dips down from it briefly to show the skeletal remains of Imhotep. Mm-hmm. now one thing i will say about these universal pictures is god damn do they end abruptly yeah <laughs> yeah that was it it's like well goodbye that's good it night. we no, barely yeah. even see his skeleton and they're like universal pictures yeah <laughs> and everybody get they up got, <laughs> they got a little porky pig thing on the corner yeah. like, that's all folks it's like what it's like, that's, that's yeah. warner brothers what, yeah. Yeah. what, what the hell did you borrow him i don't what <laughs> <laughs> it did what to say like this is a universal yeah. picture or whatever like, and that's it yeah, yeah. It's like, what that's it but um i have to ask what did you guys think of the mummy? Um, yeah, I mean, it was uh, <laughs> it wasn't action packed. It was it was it was it is a short movie. It's not bad. I do appreciate some of the things they do. I still kind of am stuck with this as being my least favorite out of the three that we've watched so far. Um, but I mean, it's I mean, I would watch it if you've never seen it. I would definitely give it. A, you know what I mean? Give yeah. it a watch. Yeah. Yeah, no, I say definitely watch it, add it to the, you know, repertoire, as it Mm -hmm. were. Um, It's something that should be seen. Do I think that it's going to be like a staple in my rewatch list? No, Um, but I'm glad that I did watch it. Yes. I think that my issue is just like you were saying, T, we're exploring some very interesting themes And getting facets of a story that I don't expect when I hear, oh, we're going to watch The Mummy. I'm not expecting some epic, you know, centuries spanning love story, whatever. I'm not expecting any of that. Yeah. So that aspect is very interesting. But then you add this rushed romance between Helen and Frank. You add people who are being explicitly given warnings and not heeding them. You add scenes that seem like something should have come before them, but they didn't. Mm -hmm. I mean, motivations are unclear. A lot of things are just really confusing. Mm -hmm. There are things that look really great, especially when you realize that this was... 1932 and there are things in this that have no business looking as good as they look yeah the performances are good mostly it's just i feel like maybe it's just the execution for me that it it, it it's a little lacking mm-hmm. um but yeah i'm i am glad that we watched it oh yeah but the, I, I i have a lot of uh <laughs> a lot of confusion yeah. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of issues and I, I i don't it's not bad it's not a bad movie but of the three that we've covered, it is my least favorite. Yeah. I think I agree with both of you. Um, 
I really do appreciate the vibe and the atmosphere of these universal horror films. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, that does rescue a lot of the screenplay from me because I think that a lot of the writing is very good, but I think maybe it's just, again, back to Dracula with the plot structure. Yeah. Yeah, it's, <laughs> there's some big <laughs> yeah. issues. It's like, yeah. oh, so we're back at the house. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool. Whatever you say. Cool, yeah, cool, cool, you cool. got a boss. Um, but no, it's it's the same thing for me. And it's honestly, I like the bit of misdirection where you're like, oh, you know, and this is hindsight because they don't know what a film about mummies is yet. Yeah. yeah. So to us looking back, having it not be what we expect. Yeah. Very interesting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I would have liked more of a well-rounded Emotep because I think that his character is so interesting mm-hmm. and his motivations are so clear. Yeah. I think to suddenly make him like, now kill your boyfriend. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, what? Yeah, yeah. that loses me a lot. <laughs> but how much more interesting would it be if his pursuits remained that level of noble? Yeah. yeah and it was something what if it was a promise that oxenamen made and she said find me yeah, yeah. that's different oh and yeah so he made that his mission yes mm-hmm. yeah and then you're suddenly you're like oh wow <laughs> who the For fuck me? is frank yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it becomes way more interesting yeah but instead, he's just taking all this on himself. Yeah, and then blames <laughs> and her. Then blames <laughs> her, and then he's like, "And I'm gonna need him dead." Yeah. <laughs> so if you could do that for me, that'd be fantastic. She's like, "I was just at a party. I don't know what yeah. the fuck. I don't about. know what's going on. <laughs> Staring out in the city. I'm getting woozy here." <laughs> um, but no, I think it's a very good film. Um, and though it's not exactly the direction I would have taken, mm-hmm. it's definitely important. Yeah, yeah. It's impactful. Very interesting with the themes it explores. Mm-hmm. Immortality, or maybe not immortality, but uh, reincarnation, right? Yeah. Eternal life, yeah, and love mm-hmm. through the ages. Mm-hmm. But it's just again, like you said, the execution. Yeah. But I guess we can uh, head into ratings. Yeah. So for me, the two biggest positives of this film are the makeup effects mm-hmm. and the performances yeah specifically boris karloff and zita johan because mm-hmm. they put in some great performances here yeah i love edward van sloan but he's smirking <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but that smirk has got to go yeah <laughs> <laughs> but i do appreciate his character because there there's something about him and his presence yeah yeah that i think that he adds to every film that he's in mm-hmm. he lends this feeling of um authority yeah mm-hmm. and just this stature of education and i love that every single time he knows everything and nobody yeah. will- <laughs> <laughs> like whatever <laughs> shut up <laughs> but um i love the sets the art direction the cinematography and the lighting it's it's it bums me out because we had a question i think last no yeah uh last month on talk mortem uh-huh and it was about um it was from Girl That's Scary. Yeah. Uh-huh. If we could teach a film class on any topic mm-hmm. of horror, what would we choose? And I chose uh, lighting and cinematography, and my mind blanked completely. Universal horror films. Yeah. With the black and white, mm-hmm. they make such great use of lighting. Mm-hmm. And this film is no different. Oh, yeah. But I just love the feel of these old pictures. I do love the romance angle. I would change it a lot. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And when I say romance angle, I mean through time. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Emotep. Not Frank and Helen. No. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> let's be clear. Yeah, let's make him a let's make Emotep a little less toxic. <laughs> yeah. And we got ourselves a ball game, I think. Yeah. But I think some stuff on the negative side is that there are portions of it that did not age well. Yeah. For sure. Um it's difficult to hold that against a film that's almost a hundred years old. Mm-hmm. You couldn't possibly know. Um, and on the other side of it as well is it's uh it's pretty derivative of Dracula. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, uh, you got Dracula and my mummy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know that old dad. Um. <laughs> uh, but for me, because I do love these films a lot, mm-hmm. and I do have nostalgia for them. I am going to bump it up a little bit. I don't think it's on the level of a Frankenstein or a Dracula, mm-hmm. but I am personally going to give out of 10 excavated artifacts, I'm going to give the mummy seven out of 10 excavated artifacts. I will watch this film again. I have fun with it. Yeah. Um, it's not the invisible man. It's not Dracula. It's not Frankenstein, but it's, it's one to watch. Yeah. yeah. And it's historically significant and it's, it's a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun today. 
Yes. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of fun. <laughs> Maybe too much fun. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I will open the floor to you. Um, I, I've never seen this movie. This was the very first time I've ever seen it. I've seen the other movie, uh, with Brendan Fraser a lot, there but you go. that, I mean, that's a, that's like an action movie. So it's not, I don't think it's it fun though. It is. It doesn't do what this movie does, but I, I will say that I do have to admit that as well. Watching this too and thinking about the other two, they are kind of a time capsule of where we were at with horror movies at the time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, there's some things that don't hold up and the, and it's like, yeah, we could do without that bullshit. Um, but again, looking at it and even seeing the end, I know we talked about it before uh, the show, but having that globe and somebody make that little airplane go around <laughs> yeah. the, the fake globe at the end, like going from that to where we are now, having a CGI realistic earth fucking at the end with universal revolving around. Like it's like, dude, we've come a long way yeah. from this shit. Yeah. Um, and it, 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 I won't lie. It isn't something I probably will watch again soon, but I would recommend if you haven't seen it to watch it. Uh, there is effects in there that are for the time. Like I was like, holy shit. I was like, this is 32 and that mm -hmm. smoke in the tub scene. Oh, I was man. like, that's fucking great. Yeah. Like I said, I, I don't know how you would do that in 32. I don't even know how you do that now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but it, it is a good movie. I, I, it, the, I won't say that. I won't say boring because it wasn't boring, but it was confusing in the middle. Yes. And I feel like that's what really hurt it for me. That and then Frank's weird and I don't understand what uh, Tutankhamen was going on. Uh, you know what I mean? I was like, <laughs> I don't know what's going on here. Um, yeah. uh, Emotep, I'm sorry. No, you're good. Emotep. Um, How dare but, you? Yeah. But it was, it was just... It was it was just that confusion that really did hurt it for me. So I won't give it on the level with Frankenstein, but... For me, on a scale from one to ten, what was it now? <laughs> excavated artifact. Es excavated artifact. <laughs> you got it. I'm going to give the mummy a six out of ten. I gave Frankenstein a 6.5. Right. So I don't want to go anything over. I did want to give Frankie a little more, but I was like, you know what? <laughs> I, I want to stay right there. I think I feel like a 5.5 is too low. And like I said, I can't go over the 6.5. Right. So I was like, okay, I'll, you know, I'll, I, I feel like I can stay right there. But I would definitely recommend anyone who hasn't seen it to watch it. This is something to experience and see for yourself to see how things, because there's a big difference from Dracula to this. Oh, yeah. yeah. You yeah, can there tell is. the risks that they started to take. And it's like, that's what I'm saying, like the time capsule. Just from those three films, you see the changes that they were like, let's try this. Yeah. Hey, you know what? Let's do this now. Hey, let's a little more whatever. So it does, uh, it does deserve that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Uh, but yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. I It's funny because I did the exact same thing with my rating um of this versus frankenstein yeah because it's just a shade below mm -hmm. um but yeah i agree with everything y'all said about the cinematography and performances i think the same it just comes down to a very confusing second act and like you said with helen's motivations it really feels like oh she's got something up her oh no she she means that <laughs> yeah okay yeah. well i it's it's uh it's really confusing and I know that there's this duality of her character as a whole that kind of, you know, makes her go back and forth. But even giving that allowance, there's some shit that is just like, what? <laughs> I'm sorry, what? <laughs> it's like, oh, so she actually did want her toilet things. But, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, she just wanted some lipstick. Okay. All right. Um but yeah, it is a very interesting, it's almost like a history lesson, like yeah. you were saying, in in horror films. And that is extremely valuable and it is entertaining to watch it even if you're only watching it through that lens but yeah i did the same thing i took my frankenstein score and i dropped it down just a little bit mm -hmm. so on a scale from one to ten excavated artifacts i gave the mummy 6.5 out of 10 excavated artifacts very good um Watch this if you haven't seen it. But yeah, it gets a little wild. It does. <laughs> <laughs> when you feel like you understand w everything that's going on, it's like, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> I will say you guys are exactly right as far as like a time capsule. Yeah. And to see 
about, I guess, the evolution of horror. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's one of the things I love most about watching these films. I'm telling you right now, I cannot wait for you to watch The Invisible Man. I can't wait either. I'm so yeah. excited. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all from us at Podmortem. What would you rate The Mummy and what should we watch next? Let us know on Twitter at the Podmortem. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram and like us on Facebook. Be sure to follow each of us on Twitter at TravisMWH, at Blood and Smoke, and at RealStreeter84. Please consider pledging to our Patreon and stay tuned until after the music for a special thank you to our Wendigo Gitter patrons. And remember, if you are consumed by a desire to recapture your past, not only are you ruining your present, but you're sacrificing your future. Until next time. Thank you for staying tuned. I want to give a very special thank you to all of our Wendigo Getter patrons. Woo! Yeah! <laughs> you guys were pointing at each other. <laughs> a special thank you to... Chris Ontiveros, Kristen Lofton, Megan Martinez, Kimberly Bass, Sophie Hodson, Anthony Jerome M., Jordan Nash, Kent Morton, Lala Thomas, Travis and Nisa Hunter, Miguel Myers ATX, Jennifer Perez, Allison O'Neill, Carissa... TJ and Angie Bronson, Gabrielle Trevino, Spooky Mom, Andy Teague, Aplin Ontiveros, Karima Rhodes, Antonio Huerta, Kimberly Kleindienst, Will Brown, Sidney Smith, Osvaldo Soto, Bobby Holmes, Donna Eason, JD Rezac, Molly Gerhard, Armand Spasto, Aaron Aguirre, Eggie, William Barry, Brittany Ramatar, Charity Oxner, Amanda Six, Mandy Rainwater, Eden, Jordan Roberts, Dylan, Melissa Sierra, Holly Bryan, Jordan Blevins, Liz Heath, Spencer Montalvo, Pancake the Panda, John Ramos, Michael Newding, Alexis Roberts, Dan Laveau, Itzy M, Gary Horton, Leisha Olivier, Kate Lamp, Carlos and Sydney, Jessica Hunter, Helena Rudder, Alan Johnston, Mariah, Livy Fun, Mandy M, Scott Troutman Wise, Towton Watson, Mozzie Bear, Brittany G, Dave Burke, Adrian Stakes, Nick Spill, Emma Hagel Kissinger, Valerie G, Emiliana, Brian Glass, CB, Maya Noches, Taylor Santana, Will Lewison, Angelique, Smelly Poo Poo Head, Beth Bauer, Ben Coons, Cookie, Esperanza J, Jason Kyle OKC, Joshua Rumley, Danielle Peralta, Hannah R, Brandon, Nicholas Carter, Sawyer Reese Farr, Dr. Diva Loves Horror, Girl That's Scary, M. Fryback, Cassandra, Andrea Simmons, Ashley Hagetta, William Rush, Ryan Brom, Megan Ochoa, Laura Lassiter, Natalie de Guzman, Eileen O., Marissa E., Sydney, Henry F., Megan M., Christy Beck, Nancy and Andy, Amanda Lopez, Cody Graves, Andy Terrell, Jason Hanavan, ML Tafoya, Abigail Spitzer, Katie K, Erica Morin, Cameron S, Nicole Stewart, Tris Wynn, K.87, Mariah Jensen, Carrie A, Lonnie Lono, Powell, Kayla E, Maggie H, and Fernando Dominguez. Wow. Yeah. Thank you all so much. Yes, thank you. We appreciate each and every one of you. We love you and thank you for your support. But let's go ahead. And wrap things up. Nah. <laughs> like a mummy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Not, not this mummy. No, no, no. Yeah, no. No. <laughs> no, not him. Scooby-Doo <laughs> mummy. Yeah. <laughs> Until next time. <laughs>